Uh, welcome everybody to the meeting of the Arlington School Committee. We are not the selectmen, um, though we are uh, potentially engaging in our last uh, exercise of municipal uh, interference. Uh, we can make any dead end streets we want one way. Uh, and if Ooh. we don't like the person, we can make the street one way inbound. Uh, we can uh, uh, award alcohol licenses to anyone we want. We can have some fun here. But this is our last opportunity because Superintendent Bodie, I think you have some good news for us on the uh, vertically challenged uh, uh, front. I think the elevator is going to be ready for the next meeting. All right. right now, we're scheduled to have it inspected on Tuesday. Do we have an antique inspector coming in? <laughs> <laughs> Don't I hope, antagonize I hope the, the inspector. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a new piston, uh -huh. so it's only partially antique. Okay, but you know, we, we, we obviously need an inspector who's used to dealing with uh, mm -hmm. uh, with, with antique equipment. And uh, oh well, well, it'll be good to get back home. Uh, we want to thank the selectmen uh, for making their space available to us. Uh, it, it's it's been fun. Uh, first order of business for tonight will be public participation. Linda Hansen. Hi, good evening again. My name is Linda Hansen. I'm the president of the Arlington Education Association. And I'm just here to give a quick update on the Park MCAS question that was reviewed at the last um, school committee meeting. At that time, there, were, there had been a very short turnaround time between the time we found out about the commissioner's recommendation and the board voted until the time you all met and wanted, you know, we're looking for some feedback. In the last couple weeks, we've had a little bit more time um, to regroup and spend a little, little more time just kind of weighing the factors, including the recommendation of the administration that if um, to go park, but very specifically to allow school choice um, on online or paper and pencil if we go park, and to just test the test and not think about it as this big preparation to see mm -hmm. how well we can do. So I asked um, building reps that we have in each building to pull their third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers together, and the same thing at the Audison, and to conduct a conversation about the pros and cons, including the recommendation, and to invite their, their, administ their building administrator to the meeting as well, so that they could really wrestle with the issues themselves. These are the people that are in the classrooms, they're administering the test, they're watching students take the test, they are the most closely connected to this whole um, enterprise. And so of the seven elementary schools, the results came back. Um, two came back strongly in favor of MCAS. And the reasoning was um, the stress related to, um, well, keyboarding, even though we know that's, that's a choice, the time nature of the park test, the, the comfort level for teachers, and the less stress for students. Um, that was felt if they if we could continue with MCAS. One school, uh, the return was kind of mixed. Um, MCAS, is the the concern was about the time test, um, time nature of park, and just going to a different test at this time of year. Just not enough time to really get ready for anything new. The other four elementary schools um, came down on the side of park. Um, most of them with a paper and pencil option. Um, Fifth grade teachers were more inclined to be interested in trying out online, I think just because more comfort level with the technology. Um, but here, teacher, the reasoning that teachers gave for Park was the interest in seeing, um, having exposure to test, test items that may be incorporated into MCAS, um, useful data about how our current programs in literacy and math prepare kids for the layered deep questions presented on the test opportunity to try out a new test format in a hold harmless environment. Um, year off from high stakes testing, that was big on people's list as well. Um, although there were some concerns around what it would mean for special education students and for ELL students. So concerns both for the students and for the work that would be involved in teachers to transition, um, to make the necessary changes to IEP plans and, and, the, and that kind of thing. Um, at the Audison, they had a pretty split. It was kind of 50-50 split. And, but nobody wanted park paper and pencil at the Audison. Math teachers were more inclined to want park than anyone else. I think there is a difference between the math system and the, the ELA system. Um, the majority of those who wanted 
Park Online wanted, it, wanted to see it as a test of the computer network. Um, strong feeling, though, um, on the MCAS folks side that we don't need one more new thing and concern about the stress uh, for students taking an unfamiliar test that they didn't feel like would necessarily help them. Um, so again, that was kind of 50-50 split at the Audison. Um, one final thing I just wanted to mention is that I participate in monthly ELA director meetings, um, coordinators, literacy coaches, as part of our EDCO consortium. And so I did ask people to go around and just say, what did you do last year? How did it go? What, do you, what is your district planning on doing next year? And of the eight districts there, um, five of them did park last year, um, Bedford, Watertown, Concord, Newton, and Belmont. And so they will do park again this year. Their experience was mixed, but I will say the lessons um, of those districts was if you're going to do park, do it as a, a no prep test. Mm -hmm. Just do it to test the test. Um, it was very stressful for the districts that tried to prepare the students and teachers for it. Um, and two districts, Lexington and Winchester, did MCAS before and will likely do MCAS again. Lincoln did MCAS last year and they're not sure, um, at least the ELA person was not sure which direction they were going for this year. So I did just want to share those mm -hmm. um, updates and insights and do really appreciate the extra time that you all decided to take to allow more time to kind of think about this question, hear from different stakeholders and, and people involved. But I do think the teachers have taken this very seriously and really feel like they are part of this conversation and would like um, to remain part of the conversation. So I thank you for your interest and your time in, in listening to them. And I, do, I don't have copies this evening, but I can leave a, a set with Karen and she can um, make copies for everyone. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Rebecca Steinitz. I'm Rebecca Steinitz. I'm a parent of a ninth grader and a educator in Massachusetts. Um, and this is the last time you're gonna see me. I have a commitment next week. <laughs> so um, I don't like to repeat myself and you know my position. I think PARC is a problematic test for many reasons. I believe DESE is pushing districts to switch to PARC in a blatant attempt to make the parkification of MCAS 2.0 inevitable. And while I'm as certain as many of you that the department's intention is to create a, a park in MCAS clothing, I'm not convinced they will succeed. Thus, I'm opposed to shifting to park in 2016. That said, I want to talk about what I'm hearing from you all, including Linda just now, which is two main rationales for switching to park, the hold harmless provision and technology. And my question is, what do these rationales have to do with students and learning? Accountability matters. I work at a school that has gone from the ninth to the 24th percentile over the last four years, and I was so happy I cried when we went from level three to level one in 2014. But Arlington is a different story. Our district goals for 2015-16 say nothing about PPI or SGP. Yes, we are a level two district, but so are Newton, Brookline, and Lexington. As achievement in the Commonwealth rises, these designations have less and less to do with educational quality and more to do with impossible metrics. You can't grow too much when you're at the top. Arlington's accountability problems are administrative and subgroup issues, which matter and continue to be admirably addressed, but do not threaten the district in any meaningful way. Looking ahead, if Arlington students take park, they will perform, relatively speaking, exactly as they perform on MCAS. That is, scores are gonna decline with PARC, they've declined all over the country, but the PARC standings will just look just like the MCAS standings. Teach to the test charters at the top, followed by wealthy districts, all the way down to our poorest districts. And Arlington will stay more or less where it is because, as we know, income is the number one correlation with standardized test results. As for individual student performance, released park items can be used to gather data, and let's not forget that 2017 will also be held harmless for whatever form of test MCAS 2.0 actually takes. In short, I'm not seeing a compelling need to be held harmless in 2016, and more importantly, I'm not seeing how being held harmless matters for authentic student learning. 
As for technology, and I'm really surprised I ended up talking a lot more about accountability than I'm gonna talk about technology because I've heard a lot about technology. I'm not worried about how students will handle computerized tests. They are the new generation. They are nonplussed by computers. We're the ones who worry. Concerns about bandwidth and devices are more compelling, absolutely. But still, those are issues for adults. Are we really going to give children a test they don't need to take, that is, test the test, to see if our technology works? As an educator, my mind boggles. In short, I've heard little in official discussions or private conversations to convince me that taking PARC will benefit Arlington students. And I hope you will take this factor into consideration as you make your important decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go on to the next agenda item, uh, MCAS accountability. Uh, Dr. Chesson with some good, uh, wonderful news. Um, we have very few slides tonight, and that's usually a good thing. <laughs> and in this case, it really is. I'll wait till the slides come up. Um, as um, the audience may or may not know, uh, accountability was delayed this year um, uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is that there were a number of reports that already automatically come with um, MCAS that the uh, Department of Education wanted to have available for Move to the right, because you don't want to turn it off. The arrows, I think. There we go. Make sure that all the reports were um, ready. There was also a crosswalk between the two um, tests that had to be done to be able to come up with accountability ratings. Do you want me to just go, or do you want to wait for the slides? What would you like to do, Mr. Chairman? Um, continue talking. Okay. Um, so just to remind everybody that accountability in Massachusetts uh, is uh, based on the Progress and Performance Index, the PPI. There are two PPIs. One is uh, an annual PPI, and the other one is the cumulative PPI, which is a weighted average. So we take this year's PPI, we multiply it by four. Um, we take last year's, multiply it by three, the previous year's by two, and then one by the fourth year out. Um, we do that to um, uh, weight the most current year's performance. Uh, we look at two PPIs. One is for all students and one is for high need students. Um, the PPI is also made up of three uh, different components. One is the CPI, which is um, about achievement or closing the achievement gap. One is SGP, which is about growth. And then at the high school level, we look at dropout rate and graduation rates. Um, bonus points are given for um, uh, cutting down the number of students in the warning category, and bonus points are given for increasing the number of students in the advanced category. Oh, there we go. We can go right to the, sec the third slide, that, if you want to just go. One more. I got it. I got it. I did it. Okay. So um, the overall accountability ratings, um, I, and the, you'll see the ones for 2014 and the ones for 2015. Um, uh, one of the, um, the asterisk in, in Bishop just to explain is that under the um, calculations for last year, Bishop did not have enough high need students for um, there to be a PPI calculated for that. Um, the regulations were changed for this year and they now do have enough high need students to have the PPI calculated. So for now, for every school in the district, we're looking at having two PPIs, one for all students and one for high need students at each school. Um, we're pleased to share that uh, Audison has moved from level two status um, to level one, level one status. Um, they were very close to, if, if you can see the high needs PPI last year was 74. So they were sort of on the cusp of um, uh, being um, a level one school last year and they have completed that transformation. Um, and then the other thing that um, is notable of this slide is that the <coughs> Bishop Elementary School 
Um, again, as I said, last year did not have a high needs uh, PPI to uh, compare to. Um, this year, because they've changed the number of students that are required for that group to be counted, um, now does have a high needs PPI, and that was 71 this year, the cumulative um, PPI, and so therefore um, they became a level two school because of that. Uh, moving to the next slide, um, just to look at the level two schools and their broad area of need. Um, at Bishop uh, in English language arts, when it says not meeting the gap goals, it means looking at the performance of students who are at, the percentage of students who are proficient advanced and the students who are below that and closing that gap. Um, they did not meet the goal for the last school year um, in English language arts and math. Um, well, one of the things that we're doing is increasing our data review in ELA and math and really having um, an impact on instruction from that review of that data. We're also focusing our PD, um, and this is across all grades, but we're focusing also in the specifically in the level two schools. Um, our PD for grades three through five um, in math focus on ass assisting high need students, and they will also re are retaining their pra uh, math practice guides, which are um, people that come in and work with students that are below, just below the standard. Um, Hardy is also a level two school. Again, in ELA and math, um, they both have the same issue, which is not closing that achievement gap. Um, we have added, uh, Hardy is a Title I school, so we've added a Title I tutor in math and English language arts. And again, the PD there is focusing in grades three through five on assisting high need students. In Pierce, um, the same um, issues exist with closing that, that gap. Um, we've added, a they're also a Title I school, so we've added a Title I tutor in math and ELA, and we'll be focusing the PD for grades three through five in the same way. Uh, Thompson actually has no uh, needs in terms of ELA. They, they got all their ELA points this year, um, but they're still working on their math. Uh, it is also a Title I school, so we've added Title I tutor in math at that school, um, and we'll be focusing the PD at the same. Um, at Stratton, uh, we'll still need to work on uh, meeting the gap goals in ELA. They're just below the gap goals in math. They almost made it. Um, they have also um, upped their data reviews, which are informing instruction. Um, they are focusing on their math coaching work, and they are retaining their math practice guides. Uh, so other assistance plans. We have um, set up a district-wide elementary curriculum council to share best practices and area of concern. We have representatives from every grade, um, and we've um, been meeting four or five times this year. Uh, it's a joint um, committee that involves um, administration, curriculum leaders, as well as teachers. Um, in addition, we're going to be deepening the coaching model this year, and we're going to be working on increasing our consistency in coaching and having, um, we're working with the, um, thanks to an application that was filed um, on behalf of Arlington by myself and um, Linda Hansen, um, we have been accepted into a professional learning network at the state. Um, that focuses on coaching and uh, programs like our lab model. So we'll be working with other districts who have similar um, programs to kind of learn from what they're doing and they'll learn from what we're doing. Um, we've sent our coaches to a training last week um, with Mr. Knight, who is uh, from uh, the University of Kansas, who is the considered to be the utmost um, expert in coaching to really try to um, keep con raising the proficiency of our coaches. And when we re review the budget request for 2016, 2017, you're gonna see that we're gonna focus on materials that are gonna allow access to the curriculum for all students um, that are al even more aligned with the Common Core than the materials that we have now. Um, budget requests for professional development and um, support centered on, centered on better meeting the needs of all the high need students. Questions, Mr. Questions Chairman? Questions from the committee? Uh, Dr. Seuss. Oh, I have a quick question about the um, numbers, PPI numbers here. Are they cumulative for the two? These are the cumulative ones, Four, yes. So 2014 are cumulative and 2015 numbers are yes, cumulative. Yes, that's when correct. When they're listed by schools, okay. Yes, that's correct. Um, is it raw, the raw scores then, or not raw, but whatever, the yearly scores? The annual. The annual scores is available? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, DESI so, website. Yes, yes website, they're on okay. the DESI website. They were released yesterday at 2, a, uh, two o'clock. I did see that. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Are these 
combined with the par those that took the part? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's one of the reasons it took so long to get accountability and, and out. Did they give you any, did they give the districts any uh, metric of how they interconnected inter these two tests that are supposedly not connectable, have no relationship whatsoever? I'm trying to understand. I, I understand your question. I'm not sure and how to they, answer that. I'm they, thinking. They, they <laughs> use it as an excuse not to give us the MCAS stuff. The, 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 well, they had to compare. There, it, you're always being compared to every district across the state. So, in order to do that, they develop a I, crosswalk. No, I understand that part, but th that usually meant we, that the public would get it by November or October, November. Right. And the schools would have got it a little earlier and stuff right. like usually that. Right. Usually late September. This year, yeah. they, they, they. I want to keep my emo the emotional aspect out of it. They said because some parts of the state were doing PARC and some parts were doing MCAS. That's correct. And your answer to their answer to you and your answer to me a minute ago was this is a reflection of the two tests. Yes. And it it boggles me. I'm not a statistician. I am an educator. But because they said one is measuring one metric and one is measuring another metric and the two metrics aren't the same, how they made them the same. And I'm not trying to put you on the no, spot. No, no, no. I understand. I, I, I think Mr. Schlicken might, might want to answer. Uh, yeah, I mean, I am a statistician, <laughs> and I do play and with an these. Educator. Uh, <laughs> and an educator. And uh, an educator. The thing is, is the state, one of the, th one of the reasons why I took some time to uh, uh, release the accountability data is, one, because the park data was later coming back, and they had to do all the metrics in terms of uh, uh, setting cut scores and, and trying to figure out what the park data means vis-a-vis -vis Massachusetts. Uh, th there was a lot of work being done to statistically equate uh, the roughly half the, dist uh, the schools in the state who uh, were PARC versus the other half that were MCAS. Um, looking through the data, and obviously I've only been able to look at data from all the schools in the state uh, for, uh, since Tuesday, uh, there are so, uh, th there are quite a few uh, schools, maybe 60, 70, even, even more, I haven't gotten a count, that were held harmless on the accountability. Some might, might have uh, moved anyway, uh, just by, by the trend of the district. Um, in, in comparing us to, uh, uh, and I'm looking more at Lowell than Arlington in this case, because that's what I paid to do. Uh, in looking at Lowell schools vis-a-vis comparable districts to Lowell that have, that, that were park districts. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of variance between the two. Um, I think that they've done a reasonably good job of equating it. There are differences. Uh, the fourth grade MCAS is statistically a harder test on, on ELA. Eighth grade is a little easier, so depending on the grade level, there might be some squishiness in a couple of the accountability numbers. But then again, the accountability numbers and the percentile, underlying percentile scores that are driving all of this are also uh, weighted over a four-year period uh, so that schools t uh, traditionally don't move a lot in any one given year. Um, do I, how, how do I feel about the numbers that we're getting? I think they're pretty good. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Not, I just want to make a statement. If they're able to meld them and put them together. My question to the state is, why the rush? Uh, I'm, I would say that what you're doing is you're looking at the performance against your peers. And mm -hmm. so if you're in the certain percentile, because one of the other things is the percentile ranking. So if you look at an accountability report, it has a bar across and it will tell you where you stand. Are you, are you performing better than 91% of the schools? So they're, they're saying, you performed here, so you're better than 91. The, is it? I understand that. All I'm saying it's only is, statistics. It's not against the same standards. The issue is, this is where we all, everyone looks at. Right. I don't want to believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ju just to the, the point that that's not where everyone looks at. I mean, this is just sort of the accountability thing that people who are looking at, at schools in bulk might be looking. I think that educators were looking this from a very different perspective in that as I'm looking at test scores coming in, I'm looking at it to schools, to classrooms, to, to look for trends, to look for strengths, to look for places where our curriculum is not aligned. And the better the test is aligned to what you're trying to do, 
the better the, um, the, the data is going to be in terms of be, uh, being able to use within the, uh, uh, within the school district to improve instruction, which is really the goal of, of the test more than uh, uh, providing realtors with selling points for individual neighborhoods. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Paul. Um, mm -hmm. So two questions, two a comment and a question. First, uh, it was a sizable jump by the Stratton School in High Needs PPI, so congratulations to the team there. D was that, so was there a best practice there that should, that can be carried throughout the rest of the district or do they look at best practices in the rest of the district and utilize it? Locally? I think we're sharing best practices across the district. I think that especially how we've designed professional development over the last couple of years, although um, not, it doesn't come cheap. Um, it's starting to have a good effect. Um, the other thing is that cumulative PPI is based on annual PPI, and annual PPI is very volatile. Yeah. Like if you look at a, a school's PP, uh, annual PPI from year to year, yeah. there's a lot of this going on, which is why they do a weighted average. So, um, you know, part of that is from last year, but part of it is that that the 35 was a weighted average and included some bad years from the previous years. So it's hard to tell exactly what, you know, it, from just looking at the numbers, it's hard to tell exactly what the impact is. Got it. And the, and the second point I want to make is I think we need to congratulate the, oh, Tim is here, the, the Addison Middle School on achieving level one status. That's a, an extraordinary achievement. So congratulations to Tim and the teachers and the whole team there. That uh, wasn't easy. It was a lot of work, hard work. And um, you did a great job. So congrats. I think one of the important things to note is that there are a number of um, interventions that we've begun at Audison that we're starting to reap benefits from that we're talking about looking at can we, um, even though high school is level one, we still want to continue to Im improve in our high need students and that we're looking at the interventions that we're doing at the middle school and can we make those same interventions at the high school in terms of some subjects and also look at, you know, what does that mean to, for the elementary schools as well. Good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Mr. Thielman beat, beat me to the punch. Um, I was happy to see that the scores are improving um, in most schools, or at least holding steady, and especially the Stratton made a big bump. But it was awesome to see the scores for Audison and see it rise to level one. Um, and then the other question is, so we don't have growth scores yet, right? SGPs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we actually do we? We, yeah. I actually presented on those I believe at the last mm -hmm. meeting I presented the last time I presented MCAS when I presented the all of the MCAS re reports mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. SGPs were in there mm -hmm. by school I thought we got it by school yes you, yeah, by, I, by, by sub, school and by, by grade sub, by subgroups do we get that I, I, yeah, I presented on okay. that, I'm sorry. but but if My but fault. if you need it again, just no, let me know no, and I'll send it to no. you. I'll, I'll go for it. Thank okay. Mm. They all break down in the accountability as well because the uh, growth uh, is half of the ELA and math uh, calculations, and you do get bonus points for improving your growth for for high growth. Uh, anyone else questions or comments on the on this report? Hearing none. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, uh, we uh, took a vote in executive session at our last meeting, uh, which we need to repeat here in open session. Mr. Thielman. For, artic for Article 2 of the agreement between Superintendent Bodie and the school committee, moved that the school committee notifies the superintendent that we desire to continue her employment beyond June 30, 2016, and enter into negotiations with her on a contract extension. It's a motion by Mr. Thielman, second by uh, Ms. Starks. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Question, are we going to put any term limit on this motion? Uh, no, this is just purely a motion to uh, declare that we are, we desire to continue her uh, employment and to begin negotiations. We, uh, anything else beyond that would be uh, subject to uh, preparing for negotiations on the part of the committee and would be done in executive session. Uh, okay. Um, uh, Can I yeah, just, go ahead. Just, uh, when we vote, mm -hmm. may we make a statement? You may. Thank you. Uh, are we ready for, oh, you can make a statement now if you like. I'll wait for the vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Okay, I see a six to one vote. Abstain. Uh, Mr. Pierce abstains. You, you, you can vote this. I can vote okay. even though, okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. 
Uh, it's a six to one vote uh, with uh, Mr. Hainer voting in the negative. Mr. Hainer would like to make a statement. Uh, I came onto the committee almost five years ago with the intent to bring back the public confidence to the school system. I've been fortunate to working with a group of people, including the superintendent, who have always been collegial and hardworking. Many things have changed for the positive, but my confidence in the superintendent is lacking. That's why I voted in the negative. I intended to read more, but I beg the indulgence of the committee. I'm going to be leaving right now. I had an accident on the way here, and I am in pain right now. I'm going to survive. I'm fine, but I'm hurting real bad right now. I'm going to pass this on, uh, the continuation of my statement and the things we uh, to the secretary and mm -hmm. get copies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, feel better, be well, take care of yourself. Um, uh, next item of business will be fiscal 17 budgetary needs of Audison Middle School and Arlington High principals. We'd like to invite the administrative staff of both uh, the Audison and the high school uh, to come forward, please. Uh, before we begin, I do want to uh, convey to the principals before us that the school committee extends our sincere congratulations to your staff and, and uh, for your hard work. You are both principals of level one secondary schools, which is a significant achievement, especially considering the size of the Otis and the bigger the school, the harder it is to uh, hit level one status. So that we want to recognize the uh, good news very formally uh, and I'm sure that as we talk budget every member of the committee is going to want to go and uh, repeat this uh, congratulations and thanks to to you for your service to the children of Arlington so uh, uh, the uh, forum is yours thank you very much for me to go first okay. so um, because of the support of the school committee and the superintendent assistant superintendent uh, parents and staff we've been able to improve every year so this is my seventh year coming before the school committee to ask you to support us in the needs that we have in our growing school and the needs that we have in our diverse population that's continuing to come into uh, our school and the Arlington school system um, and each year that we've asked you uh, for uh, supplies staffing whatever it might be that we asked you for you've done your very best to provide us with those and because of that we've worked very very hard in order to utilize those to the best of our abilities and this year being uh, named a level one school shows that everything you give us we use and we make the best of it um, we have um, our population we're graduating 338 students we're bringing in roughly 420 students mm -hmm. so uh, we're at max capacity now we're able to after working with the superintendent the assistant superintendent and the assistant principals and department chairs we will be able to um, maintain um, the the building this year but we do need additional staffing and we do need additional supplies because it's going to affect every aspect of the building it's going to affect paper usage textbooks lockers um, you know, supervision, um, you know, uh, for staff supervising students in the library is going to become an issue because we're going to have more students in the library. We're going to have more students in classes. Um, we have a, a higher needs population coming in just percentage wise. The more students come in, the more high needs students are going to come in. We have a larger population of school refusal, hospitalizations. Uh, social and emotional needs that we need to address and in order to address those so that we can and a common theme of the school committee as well has been everybody needs to progress and that's the reason why we made level one not just our high needs population but all of our population and in order to maintain that and use the data that we get from our classroom and that the teachers get from their classroom in order to be able to differentiate and do what they need to do in order to bring the type of instruction that they need to do in the classroom, we need to maintain the level of 
class size that we have now. Uh, and this is with minimum staff. It would be wonderful if we could have four clusters in sixth grade, four in seventh, and four in eighth, because that really would be the optimal um, cluster size. Um, we haven't been able to do that. To this point, we've had, last year we were able to add a fourth, two years ago we were able to add a fourth cluster to six, which really helps with the transition from fifth to sixth. We want that small personalized uh, instruction. We went to a house system. We developed the advisory in order to help this. With the, the growth of that, that means advisories are going to be bigger. The houses are going to be bigger. And if we don't have additional staff in order to break that down and make it smaller, we're not going to be able to do that. So as far as um, the cluster, additional cluster teachers, we really, we really need uh, 2.0 FTEs for um, an eighth grade, potentially eighth grade half cluster. Um, we have, in order to keep the eight, current seventh grade that's going into eighth grade class sizes at the same level as they had in sixth and seventh, we're going to need that addition for eighth. Um, so, as I said, right now our, our seventh grade class is 383. Our current um, sixth grade class is 411, and we're expecting roughly 420 in next year. So to maintain, just to maintain what we have, we would need that. Um, in order to balance out our specials, we need um, staffing in our special classes. We, we were able to balance this year better than a few years ago. You saw our, you'd see a class of eight and a class of 30, a class of 12 and a class of 35. That was due to the fact that we didn't have the proper, proper staffing across the board and, 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 able, and would enable us to balance the classes out. But because you were able to give us uh, more staffing for the specials last year, we were able to better balance it out. So this year it was much better. But with the growing, again, growing enrollment, I know that's a, mm -hmm. a hackneyed phrase now. We've been saying it for years. But uh, still, it's, it's there coming to us. So in an attempt to keep PE classes in, in the 30s, because right now the average the amount of PE classes that are above 25 is 50%. So 50% of all PE classes are above 25. And when I say above 25, I mean above 25. Mm -hmm. So uh, class size has become challenging, and it's, it's difficult to manage locker room coverage. Uh, it's become a safety issue with the current staffing. As of right now, we have PE teachers that are covering the locker room during their planning periods because they know that in order to keep the kids safe, they need to do this. They haven't complained, but I've recognized it, and we're doing whatever we can now. So we really ask for a 0.6 um, PE. Uh, in order to continue to balance the specials, we need 0.2 family and consumer science. Uh, we currently have 2.4 fax teachers, and this would provide two extra sections in fax this, for the next year. This would bring the fax department to closer the, of the same FTEs uh, with other exploratory departments, which would allow us... Com uh, consumer science? We have 2.4. Yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody yeah. understands what... Family and consumer science. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, mm -hmm. I apologize. I'm just so used to saying... Excuse me? Did you say 0.2 We would need another 0.2 mm -hmm. FTEs, which would uh, provide another class each day, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, which would help balance out the classes. Um, right now, it really would be helpful to have another school nurse. Uh, I know that this is um, a lot to ask, but to ensure an appropriate student coverage ratio, the district needs to add an additional school nurse at the middle school. Without this position, the district will fall below recommended state and federal school nurse uh, mm -hmm. staffing and student levels. Um, we would need 0.8 FTE in world language. The middle school's increased enrollment has created a need for additional class sections in the world language areas. So we look to add an additional 0.8 Spanish and French teacher. We've, Catherine Ritz has worked really, really hard to build a foreign language department. From the time that I've started till now, it has grown immensely, and we would hate to, to see anything affect that. Uh, we would need 0.4 digital media computer science. Mm -hmm. So the increased enrollment has created a need for additional class sections in the digital media computer science area. Therefore, we are requesting additional 0.4 FTE for this need because we're, we're trying to grow that. We have a really strong sixth grade uh, media computer science program right now. We would like to grow that 
to eighth grade and then eventually seventh grade mm -hmm. as well so that they have it going up so then they can feed into Matt's program at the high school. So it's really, you know, he's pushing me to do all this. I'm trying to keep up with him. Mm -hmm. um, and we also need a .5 social worker in the wake, again, of the increased anxiety felt by students and in response to the rise of school refusal and hospitalizations. We're requesting an additional .5 social worker. The guidance counselor social worker caseload is currently 300, roughly around 300. And if we do not add this .5 position, next year's numbers will be over 300, which is above the contractual limit. Um, other things, as I said, with the addition of the students uh, and needing staffing for those students, um, Matt and I were talking earlier, so if for every certain amount of students you need an FTE in order to mm -hmm. take care of them, you also need supplies and, mm -hmm. um, and other things in the building. So we would need additional lockers uh, for the girls' and boys' bathroom. I was down there a couple weeks ago looking at the lockers. They seem to be over 50 years old. Most of them you can't even use. Mm -hmm. um, they're in disrepair to the point where I'm afraid somebody's going to get hurt. Um, in the student hallways, we may require an additional 40 lockers. Uh, for students to use for, for their books, personal property. Uh, desks, again, with the increase in enrollment, we have 50 students coming in. We need 50 desks for them, 50 chairs for them, cafeteria tables. We're at the point now where uh, we're most likely going to have to go to a fourth lunch, um, not mm -hmm. next year, but the year after, we're going to have to go to a fourth lunch. We just, we, we're at max capacity as far as we can fit mm -hmm. 410 students in the cafeteria tightly that's if it, we're counting on 10 or 20 kids potentially being absent not counting on we don't want anybody to be absent but you know if 10 kids are absent out of 410 in a classroom then everybody fits in the calf if everybody shows up it's a tight squeeze mm -hmm. um, we need as far as chairs for um, when we have uh, visitors come in and we do um, presentations for the for the kids uh, and we have authors come in. We don't have anywhere for the students to sit. They can't all fit in the bleachers. And I don't like to see my students sitting on the floor for an hour and a half. They're wonderful and they're excellent and they do it, but we really need uh, folding chairs for assemblies. So 50 more folding chairs for assemblies. For, and then when we have the night assemblies, we have 50 more sets of folks coming in mm -hmm. to see their kids. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna need them for that. We also need social studies textbooks um, uh, pilot of science textbooks, Latin textbooks, mm -hmm. visual art needs. So um, these, are, these are real needs that we have in order to continue to present the same type of education that we want for all the students at Audison that I think we've been doing very well mm -hmm. for the last seven plus years uh, and we want to continue to get better. Our goal every year is to be the best middle school in the state, mm -hmm. uh, the best high school in the state, the best elementary schools in the state. Um, you know, we've clearly been supported by you in the past, and we ask you for your continued support. And thank you for giving me the time in order to present this to you. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to ask. Uh, let's go for middle school questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Thank Pierce. You. Thank you, and thank you, and congratulations. Thank you. On the level one status, that is an excellent, excellent remark. Thanks. For middle school. Thank you. Um, if you had to rank uh, in, in a top three order, the top three. Have you, have you given thought about that? And also, have you uh, put together a sort of budget monetary note as to how much uh, these items would cost? Or perhaps that's, that's more our job or, or well, Ms. Johnson's I mean, job? We do have uh, uh, Ms. Johnson put together a, a spreadsheet for us yeah. uh, for a meeting that we, we recently had. And, and I gave her all the figures that I had. And then she reported back the accuracy to those. I was a little bit under. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm asking for, um, you know, a, a sizable amount of money. I don't know if you want me to give you that figure right Say now. Say the number. Go ahead. Yes, 430000 would be roughly the number that I would be asking for. Mm -hmm. um, that includes the teachers? That includes the teachers. Um, and if you ask me for a rating, I would say that the additional cluster teachers, I, I must have them. I mean, I, I hate to say must, and I'm not here to demand, but, um, you know, the the social worker uh, is is going to be an imperative need um, and, and it's, it's really hard to rate the rest of them mm -hmm. because I feel that they're all equal in merit right. well, just as a point of clarification 
you are saying that every dollar of that 430000 is to maintain the current level of uh, services in light of the increased number of students you're getting. That's correct. I'm, I'm, there's no fat on this at all. There's mm -hmm. no fat at the middle school. We have no fat. So, Mr. Pierce. Uh, yeah, on that, um, the 0.5 social worker, would there also need to be an additional uh, guidance too? Because don't they have a load requirement? That it's the same. Okay. So, in my plan years ago was to move social workers in because of the needs of the students. Because okay. we have so many social emotional needs at that grade level, school refusals and you know hospitalizations. Uh, I had a doctor call me from. Um, was a mass general last year and he said you know I, I want to talk to the principal so I said hey how are you doctor and he said great I noticed that you've had six hospitalizations I said really yeah um, no we've had 36 hospitalizations this year um, so um, that's really something that needs to be addressed um, and you know and that's really the reason why I want social workers in the building to help us deal with that they can deal more with the issues that students are, are, are you know, looking at when they're in middle school. Thank you. So, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm just trying to clarify. So for the cluster expansion, you need how many FTEs? So the model that we're looking at right now, and it may change, mm -hmm. but what we were looking at right now when I was talking to Dr. Bodie and my assistant principals, we had a meeting a few weeks back, was looking at a half cluster, which is different than a split cluster. So a split cluster would say take three classes of one grade and two of another. A half cluster would mean you'd have two teachers that were dual certified, which I think that I talked to Mr. Slickman about last year mm -hmm. at this time about the, the you know, this, mm -hmm. what that would look like. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to get somebody that was really strongly qualified in both yeah. areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that we're looking at right now because it would, you really can't do a split 6-7 and a split 7-8. Mm -hmm. So you'd, you have to, you, what we could potentially do is um, add two teachers to sixth grade and do a split 7-8. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just, so we're just looking at it right now and we're trying to decide what the best model would be. So in our paper it's listed as two, but it's made up of 0.5 math, 0.5 social studies, 0.5 English, 0.5 science. I think that was an earlier thought, but oh, okay. right now um, we're really thinking of a half cluster mm -hmm. okay. for, one, for either sixth or eight at this point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Mr. Thielman. I just want to try to get, so it's $430,000 increase. How many FTEs? What's the total FTEs? Um, four and a half, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> four and a half? That's, no. Yeah, four and a half. Mm -hmm. Four and a half FTEs. That includes the... the 5.5 5. 5 plus supplies. Mm -hmm. What's that? 5.5 5 plus 5. supplies. 5.5, 5. okay. Okay, 5.5, 5. and that's... He, was and a, the, he guessed a little light. I was a little light on the number. 467.8. I get nervous when I'm asked to say numbers <laughs> All right. because I don't know if I'm supposed to say them. I didn't get permission to say numbers tonight, so, <laughs> right. so I apologize. 467, 8,000. You started asking those questions. I was like going in with my thing looking for You had time hand. to, yeah, you got time to prepare. 5.5 FTEs. We, we, we like numbers and we live with them. Yeah, yeah, we have to, so I just, and, and the highest priority is Classroom teachers. Classroom teachers, social worker, and yeah. then everything else uh, I hold. Classroom teacher is how many classroom teachers? To that would be two. Two. Classroom mm -hmm. teachers, and then the 0.5 social worker. 0.5 social. I mean, obviously, we want to give you it all. Mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate that, and you've always tried to do that. Yeah. I appreciate that. But I just wanted to get that. Mm -hmm. And the language, what are you saying? 0. 0.8 language. 0. 0.8 language, yeah. That would be a split French Spanish. Okay. So. Congrat and by the way, congrat I want to congratulate you personally on the Appreciate achievement that. of the Thank level you very one. Much. That's quite an achievement. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, let me just ask uh, uh, one question for you. Um, when the Addison opened in 1998, um, it, we, we converted it from a two grade school to a three grade school, six, seven, eight. There were 966 students in your school. You had 1107 in October 114. What was the October 1 count for 15? Do you know? 1136. 1136, and uh, and climbing. Uh, if you, if we get the additional teachers and and the additional staff, where are we going to put them? Well, for this year we can make it. <clears throat> excuse me. For the upcoming year, we can still make it work. Mm -hmm. If I have to move some teachers, I've already talked to some of the department chairs on 
how we move teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't need to divide any of the rooms at this particular point. However, the following year, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, at, in conversation with the superintendent and the assistant principals and department chairs and you know, the high school principal and elementary school principals, we would need to think about you know, are we, would we need modulars? What would that look like? Yeah. Who would we put out there? Where would, you know, we know where they would go, roughly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then 10 years down the line, would we be able to maintain that or would we need to open? I know that there's been public conversation about this, so hopefully I can mm -hmm. say this freely, that there was talk of opening the Gibbs again. Mm -hmm. I know that that was a conversation that had been um, discussed. Because, you know, is it really a good idea? I mean, I'd like to speak to everybody about this and hear your philosophy behind it. Is it a good idea to have 1,500 middle school students in one school? Mm -hmm. uh, and are you going to be able to break that school up in a way to to um, keep the integrity of all three grades mm -hmm. and make it feel as small of a learning community as you can because that's what, really what we've been trying to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, by starting the house system, which has been hugely successful, and having grade level meetings to deal with grade level issues, um, that's been hugely successful. And adding in the advisory, we've been able to maintain that. But when you get up to 13, 14, 1,500 students, is that going to be tenable? Is that going to be something that you're going to be able to do? Um, and I, I mean, I have my theories on that and my ideas on that, and I would love to hear uh, others' uh, ideas on that as well. Uh, Mr. Thielman. You know, one question for you. So a bunch of us are, well, all of us are wrestling with uh, space and enrollment issues, and so there have been a lot of different ideas um, thrown out. And you, you're not ready to answer, so you don't have to. Maybe you can think about it. One idea is, uh, and this is not next year, but it's at some point in the future, to separate the sixth grade, to have a seventh and eighth grade. Another idea is to separate the eighth grade um, <clears throat> and put it with a high school. Those are ideas, not proposals, and not for FY17. So I'm just wondering if you could give us, if you give some thought to what's best sure. educationally and let <clears throat> us know at some point. Well, in my experience and talking to other principals in middle schools that, that made a split, uh, a friend of mine uh, was a teacher in a middle school. I was a teacher at the time, and he, his middle school split because it grew to be too large. And they moved sixth, seventh, and eighth. So then they had to decide who to move. What teachers do we move? What students do we move? What specialists do we move? And it was really messy. And the teachers in one school said, um, you know, why did we have to stay here? Why don't we get to the new school? You know, why do we have to stay in this old school? Is there something wrong with us? And then the teachers in the new school said, why do we have to leave our friends? Why do we have to leave where we were comfortable? So there was a lot of morale issues, and it was really tough for the parents, and it was really difficult for the students. So in the experiences that I've had, um, because I've been involved in a situation where we had to move an eighth grade class, I'm not saying that we move the eighth grade, but potentially you could move a sixth grade class, you know, to the Gibbs, say. And this is a conversation that I've had, again, just thinking out loud, not saying that this is something that we would definitely do, but just thinking of moving a class. So now you have that transition to another school. And I know that the argument would be, so now there's another transition that students need to make. Now they need to transition into uh, the Audison, per se. But you know, having them have an experience that's all their own in, in a situation where you can deal with all the transition factors of going from fifth to sixth and all the needs of the sixth grade students and having a school that's just designed for those needs. And that's really what we're attempting to do now at the Audison with the house system and having the clusters anyway does that. But now this is a whole situation that's geared just toward them. There's no distractions from anything else. And at that point, I think that they would be stronger and more ready for another transition if they had a whole year just for themselves. Um, and th this is done, I've seen this done in other districts. Again, it's a fifth, sixth. So you do one through four, five, six, and then seven, eight. Um, and that's still another transition. And students are resilient, and I think that they would be ready for that additional transition. So that's something that I thought about. Um, moving the eighth to the high school, I've seen that before in another district that I've been in. That didn't work out as well. Um, I don't know. Um, but I really think that moving a grade, so now you have, you know specifically which teachers you're going to move. You know specifically which specialists you'd need to move. Um, there would be difficulties, but I think there would be fewer difficulties in that type of a move than if you moved six, seven, and eight. Thank you. So, sure. Mm -mm. Well, we have you here one last question. Sure. We're looking at Park MCAS. Sure. Um, do you want me to be completely selfish? Go ahead. Uh, okay. So, I mean, as an administrator, I'm looking at Park 
Uh, again, there are going to be infrastructure problems. There were problems when we first brought in MCAS. There were things about MCAS that people didn't like. Um, it took years for people to grow uh, used to MCAS. So there's always going to be trepidation. There's going to be fear. Um, we've done a lot of work with the Common Core. We've done a tremendous amount of work in all the schools toward the Common Core. And when you talk to the department chairs, who are really the experts in this, um, when you talk to the department chairs, they really feel that all the work that they've done has led them to a point where park is the next natural progression, the next natural step. Um, if you talk to Matt Coleman, he'll tell you that there's seven different ways to answer questions correctly on a park, M on a park test. Wow, I almost did that. I almost said park MCAS. On a park test, <laughs> that is not true in MCAS, which allows the student to think differently than they would. Um, as far as, again, selfishly, administratively, park test is, was far easier for us to, to give. There's, I am in fits and starts um, during MCAS because I'm so afraid. One year I had to call Kathy and say, Kathy, we lost a test. And she said, well, you're going to need to go to MCAS school. <laughs> and then and finally, I think I... <laughs> <laughs> that was what, that's what uh, Desi used to do. They used to make you go to MCAS school. So, <laughs> you know, so I would always be so terrified that I'm going to... And every day we have to count everything and go through everything. And again, I know this is a selfish thing and you know, this is difficult for myself and, and my staff. But it really is uh, something that is so cumbersome that it takes, you know, the guidance staff away from, because I need to use guidance to help me count the test. I need to use guidance to help me implement the MCAS. So now students are coming down to talk to guidance. They're not there. They're, you know, as much as they should be because they're helping with MCAS because something has to give. So this really is something that would be helpful to us. Again, I know that Laura has been really looking into what it's going to take to be able to, and this is something that she's thought about quite often and talked to us about. What are we going to do about technology? I think she has some answers. You know, so from my perspective, um, and you know, again, the real experts to talk to on this would be the department chairs, but I really feel that this is our next natural progression. And again, from a purely selfish standpoint, we would be able to maintain a level one status for at least two, if not three years. And I think that would be nice. I would like to be able to say that. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the principal? Dr. Changer. Um, well, first, um, everything he said until he started talking about clusters and specifics, mm -hmm. you just change it to high school. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty much going to say a lot of what, um, mm -hmm. what Tim said. Also, we're talking a lot about congratulations in level one and level two. If we deserve any credit for being a level one high school, um, it's because of the work that's done by the middle school and by the elementary schools. Um, and once folks get to us, we have such excellent students who are doing so well that we're able to really focus on a very small number of them who are not being successful in order to really focus our energies. Um, the, the other thing I think that's important when one is level one, they have an opportunity to sort of talk about um, the broader picture of these sorts of ratings. I mean, Arlington High School is, you know, not only a level one school, but on lots of other ratings. You know, we're, we rose up to 19th in the state on MCAS scores. We were a gold medal school in U.S. News. We were a top school in Newsweek. And none of this is because we've done a great job. It's because we have a great district. <laughs> Um, but the other thing to realize is that depending on how they write the algorithm next year um, and depending on how they fiddle the MCAS and the park next year, we have every reason to expect with the rising expectations of, of yearly progress and everything that we will, as a result of some subgroup or another, trip and be a level two school. Um, and so I think it's really important for us, rather than sort of looking at that final score at the end, mm -hmm. Um, to use that motivation to look at how are we doing with our subgroups. You know, so that's just, it's the thing you can only say when you've got level one. Every year I get level one, I assume I'll be level two next year, and it's important to say that to everybody. Um, so that said, um, the things that we've been focusing, so first of all, the things we've been focusing on in the high school. Um, we've done a lot of work this year on social-emotional support, on creating a stronger social emotional environment and set of relationships within the school. We continue to work on implementing more effectively digital technology in order to make more engaging um, and effective instruction. Um, and we've continued to do an awful lot about focusing on high need students. 
looking at both social emotional issues and learning issues and making sure that we have the right settings and the right programs in place for all of those. Um, I don't envy the decisions and choices that you and Kathy Bodie have to make. Um, the district has sort of an impossible combination of, you know, short funding, tight salaries, short staffing, enrollment that's going up, and ancient buildings that don't fit all of the students. Um, so when I make this presentation about what it is we think we need, I say that understanding that there's going to be a lot of very tight decisions made by all of you. And so I welcome decisions and questions. I'm a little bit shy about asking for almost anything, knowing that the middle school is almost going to rival the high school in size relatively soon, um, even though they have only three, three levels of students. That said, I think I'm just going to go right into sort of the numbers and the explanations behind the numbers. Um, so this year we've experienced, depending on how you count and which version, an enrollment increase of 48 students over the last year. We expected an enrollment of about 24 students. Um, last year when we were looking and having the same conversation, we were looking for, and again the numbers will change, 3.6 students to get us up to equal. We didn't quite get those numbers. So we continued to be, as Tim has said, tight. We continued to have the large class sizes. We actually saw an uptick in the large classes um, and those sorts of challenges. We saw that. Clarification, you yeah. wanted 3.6 additional FTEs Correct. to manage the increased enrollment. To manage the okay. increase in enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, and we got more enrollment than we expected, and we didn't get all of those FTEs. So we continue to be tight. We've seen a little bit of an uptick in large class sizes. Um, so right now, it's very difficult to say. When we look at our own version of the numbers, we expect about another 15 kids. So we're working in our own minds off the number 1280. There's lots of enrollment projections you've seen. That doesn't match any of them. But yesterday I looked and we have 1265 and there's lots of enrollment projections and that doesn't match any of them either. So those are the numbers that we're looking at when we make these requests. And we looked in terms of making these requests in the same way Tim did, at actual kids and actual seats going from English 9 to English 10 or going from French 1 mm -hmm. to French 2. Um, and the other thing that we're looking for as we go forward is attracting and keeping excellent staff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the, the sort of fractional numbers that we look for in each of the core departments, the five academic departments, allow us to create full-time positions by shuffling people around and post for people that we're expecting we're going to need. And so in some cases, they take us right to where we need to be. In some cases, they may give us an additional section. We can't hire people in fractional pieces. It also means that potentially we won't come to for quite as many the year after or potentially if they're off again by 15, we're not in quite as tight a situation as we are. So that said, um, right now the average student load for teachers in the core content areas is st still high, between 20.5 and 20.8, um, depending on the department. The result of that is that we have class sizes of 25 or over at the level of 29% in science, 25% in math, 27% in, in, I'm sorry, 25% in history, 27% in math, 15% in English, and 20% in world language. And I have a hand that I'll give you all when I'm done. So you don't have to write all that down. Um, in addition, the elective classes are at their caps. So if you look at the art classes, they're all pushing 23 to 25. The facts classes, we try to cap them at 20 for safety. Almost every single one of them is at 22. Um, and so the limits are size of the space, size of the facilities, and the safety with which we can support them. Um, we also foresee the following trends having a real impact on staff. We have the same issues that Tim has in terms of social emotional um, struggles with students. This is not something that is specific to Arlington or Arlington High School. Last week I went to an EDCO meeting. We spent two hours with all of the local principals talking about the fact that this seems to be something which is challenging all of our students. Exactly why and exactly what we all have lots of theories and there are things that we're all working hard to do about it. Um, we continue to have the issue that Chapter 222 and the new laws require us to educate students who come to us with felonies or really challenging backgrounds. So one of the things that happens in lots of ways, frankly, in the public schools nowadays is that enrollment is growing, but not only is enrollment growing, we are expected to and want to educate a whole portion of students who did not in the end necessarily get educated by us. 
And so those students are being educated by our Millbrook program, they're being educated in our Summit program, they're being educated by us, often in other sorts of uh, programs where they're not even able to be in the building. And all of those put a strain on the deans, they put a strain on the support staff, the social workers, and the administration, which takes that support away from our regular ed teachers. So a lot of the things that give them support with their large class sizes, even though they may have the same staffing levels and those administrative levels and social work levels, those folks are not able necessarily to pay attention, sometimes even for kids our classroom teachers aren't seeing. Um, so the, uh, you know, the other thing is we do, we get stressed about these level one, level two things. And those are ever rising expectations. And so I think it's really important for us to sort of keep the teachers focused on the kids in front of them. Um, and it's something that we're always talking about. It's like, look at the high need student, look at the students who are not making progress, you know who those are. Look at the students who are not passing, you know, the MCAS, but look at them because that is the student in front of you. Some, I was interviewed a couple weeks ago by someone who was interviewing um, principals of schools that did well with their minority students, and they asked us what we did, and I said, one, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and two, um, we just manage by spreadsheets, which is primarily lists of names, because the names are a small enough list that we can know who they are and make connections to them. Um, so, what we're asking for. We're asking for, in order to keep, um, to lower the class sizes in the content areas, in order to allow us to attract good quality staff at full-time positions, um, and in order to meet the existing curriculum requirements student needs, and frankly, to address safety issues in places like FACS and in science. We're asking for a 0.4 um, teacher in math, um, to teach math, pre-algebra, and computer science, a 0.4 teacher to do math high needs, to co-teaching, with our special education staff to improve our content area instruction with those high, high needs populations. We're asking to do that co-teaching model, we're actually looking to do that in the other content areas as well, but that's covered in the asks that they're asking for. Um, so in English, a 0.6 to make a full-time position. In social studies, a 0.8, and it's actually listed in other things as 0.6, but we meant 0.8, it's a typo. Um, science, biology, to teach sections of biology, which are large, and physics, which are large, 0.6. And then in world language, and if you need someone to explain it, I'll point to Catherine, to handle the pipeline and shuffle of people who are certified. One of the challenges, both in science and in world language, is that they're not really one department. There are multiple departments. If you're a physics teacher, you can't necessarily teach biology. If you're a Spanish teacher, you can't necessarily teach French, but some people can. Um, and so in world language, a 0.2 French section and a 0.2 Spanish section. Um, those get shuffled in with other people. In addition, it would be extremely helpful in terms of reducing stress and giving students opportunities for electives to add an additional 1.4 FTE, which what we're looking at right now is an additional section of family, culinary and family and consumer science. This year we had 80 students request those classes who were not able to get them. They flow into other electives. Um, and then our art department um, would like a 0.6 position. They believe they can fill that. Um, in art, again, to add additional sections. Those would be dependent really on enrollment. Um, in addition, in that 1.4 FTE, I would like to make a case for a 0.6 um, industrial arts teacher to start to continue to expand and develop our makerspace program. Right now we have that space teaching both woodworking classes and then uses an interdisciplinary space so that our STEAM program, science, technology, engineering, arts, math, can actually fabricate the things that they're designing in CAD classes and in other things. That's a, that area is in use all day long, every period of the day, with Mr. Tassoni supervising, doing things for physics classes and sculpture classes and engineering classes and other programs like that. Um, we'd like to be able to offer classes in there. The challenge right now is we offer two sections of woodworking. If you offer, when you have those two sections of woodworking, the space is largely shut down for classes. Um, in addition, we have people like Frank Tassoni and industrial arts teachers are hard to, um, to attract, and so we'd like to start developing that programming and that population so that when we go to the new building, we know really what that sort of multidisciplinary space is going to look like, and we have the staffing to really be able to develop it going forward. I like your optimism about the new building. That's <laughs> We're going to get a new building. It'll be, it'll be in my career. <clears throat> yeah, okay, good. It'll happen. Good, good. Um, and then this is here on my list, but it's not there on many of the other lists, and I'm saying it only because it's something which our staff has requested and our, our department heads have requested, and we understand the realities of administration. Um, 
There are a lot of things that put a lot of stress on our staff right now. We have large class sizes, we have increasing needs among students, and we have um, the building, which is a rough place to teach, especially with the elevator broken lately. Um, we could make them all a lot happier by re reducing their class sizes by 10%, but that would require us to hire 10 more teachers. Um, the people that are the sergeants who do the care and feeding of the teachers and make them less stressed are the deans. And so when I, I was actually shocked last year when we had this whole conversation with the staff that two teachers were asking for administrators. Teachers never ask for administrators. And so they asked again this year, and the deans, at the department heads asked again this year. So I know the challenges, I know where we are in terms of realities, in terms of budgets, but it's in there. I know it's not on the other list, so I want to just know I'm not talking out of turn there. I just put it in there to be respectful to people. Um, so those are our main, main areas. The other things that I want to just emphasize are in terms of social emotional support. This year we rearranged our, entire, our schedule to create a five day schedule. Um, the, the research and other things say that that alone is a stress reducer for kids, particularly kids with executive function and organizational issues. Um, it's been really funny because I've gotten in the habit of saying, hi, today is December 1st, it's Monday and it's a B day, and now every time I say it's Monday, and it's Monday, um, because it's a Monday schedule and so people know where it is they're supposed to go. Um, I can actually now in the hall when a kid asks me what it is, say what day is it and tell them where they're supposed to go. Um, in addition, that new schedule created the opportunity to have two spaces, the campus period X block and the activity period X block. The advisory activities are during the, um, the activity period X block. A group of teachers has been developing a coherent program of, of activities that are focused on creating connections and relationships between staff and students in the school, finding cons consistent communications around things like planning for school and activities, um, and, pos and fostering a positive school climate. It's, um, it's been a pretty remarkable success, particularly given, frankly, about the most difficult year I've ever experienced for the beginning of a school year. Mm -hmm. um, so that group, we really want to make sure that we continue the support and we need funding in order to keep them able to really develop the curriculum to reach out to folks. We've been working with Rachel Polliner, who wrote the book as a consultant, and she has done a fabulous job of really turning this work on advisory, and, and they're frankly doing the same thing at the middle school, and Catherine Ritz is leading the group there and working with her as well, as a tool for teaching our staff how to run and, and address those needs in lots of contexts. Because when you have a conversation about how to lead difficult conversations in advisory, that translates into class. When you have a conversation um, about how to, you know, have students get to know one another in class, how to deal with difficult students who are oppositional in class activities, those are all things that transfer into a stronger social emotional environment across the, the realm. In addition, when students get used to having adults in the school ask them how they're doing every day and knowing who they are, they're more likely to expect the school to do that as a matter of course. Um, digital technology is something, and I appreciate the incredible amount of resources. I got to give the nod to Dr. Chesson for helping us with this. We've come a remarkably long way in two years. Um, with the laptops last year and now the um, Chromebook pilots and the iPad pilots in the high school, um, you would not think that we were a school that was not a connected school two years ago. Um, there are freshmen, I know one of them, who are largely paperless in their life in spite of the fact that we didn't think we'd gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. Um, because the teachers are using the Chromebooks and using the iPad so extensively. Where we've done the pilots in many of the departments, for example, in English where we have three teachers sharing two carts, um, the entire English department is sharing the two carts. They have an incredibly complicated system to make sure that the pilot groups are able to do it in their own classes because mm -hmm. they're supposed to be connected. Um, but then everybody else steals them every moment that they have. So I think it's really important to keep that, that, um, that level of of mm -hmm. staffing and um, consistent. Much of that's gonna come through capital, but there are things that we'll need from the school committee. Um, so, oh, I also have to give the nod to AEF in case anybody's here, because two of those things also came from them. They're listed in my list. Um, we need to make sure we invest in wireless and network capacity. They've done a lot of work, but they're still recalcitrant, and it's really important that they work all the time. Um, the makerspace is something that allows everybody to take that digital world and make it into a reality. Um, we need something that is not, that, that is hitting my budget relatively hard and department budgets relatively hard, is replacement parts and bulbs. 
Mm -hmm. um, when we buy everybody $30,000 worth of projectors, it's great, but every year we lose about six $80 bulbs and we lose one or two projectors and we lose one or two computers. And those are not things that are represented in the other budgets. So that's something that really needs to come to the building. Um, and then time and funding for ongoing professional development on this. Part of the reason we've been successful is we had a quarter of our staff participate in Ed Tech Teacher a year ago. We have the staff doing the pilots right now. We have the teams that are working on this and that really makes it effective. And then last but not least, the building. We are hopeful that sometime in the next week we'll get a thumbs up or if not that a year from now we'll get a thumbs up. I'd be willing to put money on within the next year, not so much on next week. Um, but that means nonetheless that we're talking about breaking ground 2019 or 2020, unless they're faster than I think they are. So we're gonna have thousands of students pass through the building in that time. And if we want um, to keep being able to give the kids the best experience they can and also having the teachers not struggling. I was told today the good news was the elevator's gonna be working within the, within the few days and the bad news we're not gonna have heat in Fusco House for the next two days. Um, that is the life we live on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And it puts a real strain on teachers, it puts a real strain on administration. Mm -hmm. I would not need a new dean if you gave me a new building, because Mr. McCarthy could spend his time not running around fixing things and coordinating mm -hmm. with um, maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to say while I'm at that, many, many people we appreciate. Maintenance, Carlos, Jeremy, Mark have been doing a <coughs> wonderful job of working with us over the last two years. Things have gotten better. And Ruth Bennett has shown up and she is, I don't know if a breath of fresh air is exactly the thing, but she is a breath of something. <laughs> she is fired up and she is moving forward on making things happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really appreciated. We really hope we make progress on that. Um, so I've written athletics here on the bottom of my thing as I did last year as just a moment to turn my head and say, Melissa, is there anything you wanted to say about athletics? Here you are. Yes, sure. Um, and uh, come up. Yep. Uh, Should I move? Yeah, the, the mic is critical. There are people who watch this on TV. Hi. All right. Um, in the athletic, uh, in the budget request this year, there is a hundred and fifty thousand dollar increase in budgeting, which isn't uh, reflective of an increase in spending, but rather the last year and a half or so, um, Ms. Johnson has worked closely with me and we've collaborated to really assess the demands and needs of the athletic department. There are so many different intricacies of costs um, and costs that change over time that we felt it was important to really evaluate where we were at. Uh, so there are a couple factors that go into that $150,000, and part of it is, as you've heard, is a theme, uh, increase in growth. So our participation numbers have increased tremendously. I have registration numbers. Um, last fall, we were very excited when we cleared 400 registrants, and this past fall, we cleared 524. Mm -hmm. uh, this last winter, we were at 290 athletes registered, and for 2015, we're at 391. Mm. Um, over the course of a year, we service well over 1,200 athletes, um, you know, different capacities, and if you're familiar with athletic schedules and demands, it's, it's a year-round, you know, pretty much a year-round, six days a week, um, different programs and activities are running. With that, they require transportation, supervision, staffing, officials, and equipment um, to compete, which are really the fundamentals to keep our programs running. And that's what constitutes, you know, this hundred and fifty thousand dollars to meet really strong um, rise in the transportation costs, um, relative costs increase over time of equipment. Uh, we have increased some coaching positions to maintain safety and supervision, um, and then just really outfit uniforms, just the things that we need to meet these numbers um, and service these student athletes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, on, the high <clears throat> on the high school, um, no. questions or comments? Mr. Pierce. Thank you for being here and, and sharing this with us. Same questions that I had for Mr. Roger. Um, your top three, if you had to pick. I'm going to try to remember what they were. And, uh, <laughs> and give us a number. Give us the number. Mm -hmm. From the number I got, I started calculating it's, when we were uh, here. It's, it's roughly 724,000. I mean, how many FTEs? Is it? I'm sorry. 5.4. 5.4. Well, my count is 
Um, it's up in some and down in others and so. Right. So if you take out athletics, um, I calculated off of the spreadsheet so we can go around. But if you take out athletics, it's about 370,000. Is that correct? Roughly. Okay. Um, and that's for the entire ask. You asked for priorities. Um, so, I mean, it's hard not to ask for folks to fix the building and keep fixing the building, right? We need, you know, doors and fi doors fixed and um, and bathrooms repaired. So, um, I don't know if that counts as one of my priorities. My first priority is certainly staff, um, and within the staff, um, particularly the 3.2, to um, allow us to hire full-time staff um, in the content areas. Um, that is our main ask, really. Um, the second, you know, some of the other things like the advisory money is pretty short money. Um, and, and then this, the other than it, continuing advisory would be huge, but that's short money. And then technology, um, continuing technology, but that's not necessarily here, that's capital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think you says for three, I give you four. Great. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss. Um, I looked at, had the opportunity to look at your school improvement plan, and I was very impressed by the level of detail and um, aspiration, and it was just a very impressive document. And the question I was going to ask, which I think you've already answered, is um, how you felt the five-day schedule was going, but it sounded like you feel like this is something you want to continue. Yeah, I mean, or, it's, it's gone I mean, remarkably. We a survey at the end of the year, but. It has gone remarkably well. We're going to do a survey, actually, in January. Um, but the union did a survey, mm -hmm. um, which was more about staff stress. And um, they, people came out neutral on the schedule and neutral on advisory, which to me is a win. Mm -hmm. um, given that it has been, I mean, this year has been very funny. We had the late start. Um, we had more interruptions to the schedule than a usual fall. Um, that is very noticeable with an advisory schedule. A lot of things hit that schedule, which would have made it, if it was going to go wrong, it had every reason to go wrong this fall, and people have been fine with it. Uh, it's not something we're considering changing at this point. Okay, Anyone else? Thank you very much. Okay, I make Thank a you. Uh, Dr. Bodhi. Um, I also want to add my congratulations, but I think that one of the things that you've heard tonight, which I think is a very important um, mm -hmm. thing that I want to point out, is that certainly we're very um, we're very focused on providing uh, rigor and helping all of our students to struggle. But we look at it very holistically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of thought around social-emotional health, health, health classes themselves so that students can make good choices. So I think that one of the things that I think is to be complimented in both the middle school and the high school mm -hmm. is that they really have a very a broad view of what education is. And I, I, and at the in athletics, uh, certainly the work that uh, Melissa has done in captain's council and leadership training really has an effect with the whole high school, but it will have a profound effect on the work that they do and how they move forward. And actually to that, uh, this, since she's here, I, I, I highlighted the newsletter, mm -hmm. but um, uh, she is receiving the statewide TED uh, Damco Award which is quite an honor in the MIAA. Uh, this will be awarded in March. They, they choose one athletic director in the state, and she was nominated and, um, and they went through a vetting committee and the award was given to her. So I want to congratulate her, and uh, it's, quite a, it's quite an honor for her as well as it is for the school. Thank you. The work is very good. Also, there are uh, some people had to leave, but I think it would be uh, great to have people that are here tonight introduce themselves because they are very much part of the team that makes this all work so well. And so maybe we could just go around and, and start with you, Larry. Yeah, Larry Weather, Science Director, K-12. Um, people will not be able to hear this, so. Oh, let me introduce it, them then. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Larry Weathers, who is our science director, K-12. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane Johnson, you, you know, mm -hmm. Linda Hansen, and of course, Allison Elmer. Uh, our director of world languages is Catherine Ritz. Stand up, please. 
<laughs> You've heard her name mentioned a few times tonight with respect to the uh, advisory at the middle school. And our new director of social studies, K-12, Denny Conklin, who will come before you at some point this year Stand to up, talk please. a little bit about social studies. <laughs> I can't see who's back there. Trish Bellarossi. Oh, Trish. Yes, uh, Trish Bellarossi, who is our lead teacher in family and consumer science and uh, has both worked at the middle school and the high school. And we had, to, we had three of our assistant principals from the middle school here tonight, Maureen Murphy, Jack Flood, and Wendy Salvatore. Mm -hmm. So they're all very much part of a team working together. And I think that um, one thing I can say is how proud I am of them. It, it's quite a great group of people, and I include all of our elementary principals as well, who work very well together, very collegially, to, to make the best decisions we can for the district and our children. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, Park or MCAS uh, decision. Uh, it, it's the intent of the chair to, uh, to ask for a vote on this at the next meeting, which will give the elementary principals as well an opportunity to uh, uh, have a say before us before we actually make the vote. But at this point, seeing that we have already started the discussion and this isn't the final discussion, uh, we have obviously one bit of new information before us is the uh, status of the Odyssey. And I know that people have been thinking about this, so I'm just going to open it up to members of the committee who might have questions at this point that they'd like to have answered uh, between, uh, tonight so that it could potentially inform their decision for uh, next Thursday. So does anyone have a question or a point to make at this point? I'm, Dr. Seuss. I'm just confused. The status of the Addison, what are you referring to? Excuse me? Uh, oh, the, 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 the level one status and oh, because oh, of the... Uh, yeah. I hold harmless provision uh, that there'd be certainly an advantage for them to uh, move testing to the one where they would be held harmless. Mr. Pierce. A couple quick questions. I don't know if you know the answers, but I, I've heard from some folks that the MCAS questions mm -hmm. were getting to be more geared towards the Common Core. Is that not true? Um, the last, uh, at the last meeting, and I'm sorry you weren't here, mm -hmm. and I, I'll send you a copy of the presentation if you don't have it. Um, I did a presentation on PARC, and while there has been some movement in MCAS, um, I showed uh, two math questions, one that was from MCAS and one that was PARC. There's a distinct difference mm -hmm. um, for the very fact that the PARC question has more than one right answer, and the MCAS question that? only has one. Yeah. Um, but also that the level of um, reading and the, what you need to do with nonfiction readings is quite different from parks mm -hmm. from MCAS. So while there's a there's some slight movement, it's it's not the test is just not designed to be the same kind of test. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why would the state say, I mean I can I can presume <laughs> why, uh, we're gonna hold you harmless if you try this new test that we'd like you to try, but mm -hmm. we're not gonna hold your scores harmless if you continue with MCAS. Because one is a new experience and you have a test that you have not experienced and right. it would not but and, every test un is unusually, a new unusually, um, it, yeah. But it's the 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 the, the type of test is is quite different. Right, and and there are going to be two sets of English, two sets of math tested, right? With just there, just as uh, yes, there's a it, instead of just one. It's, but it's all, the testing window is just Larger. one. It's just one testing window. Yes, that's correct. So what, last uh, last year and the year before, there were two testing windows. One was performance-based assessment, and the other one was for the regular end-of-year assessment. And then this year, it's been changed. And there's thank you. And there's only there's only one window, mm -hmm. one window of testing. Mm -hmm. okay. So and mm -hmm. the while um, and and the the minutes of testing are a little bit more when we when we look at how much time students will spend in the testing <coughs> environment, it's either about the same or a little bit less actually because of the. Um, you know, s students are, are creatures of habit, and if right. we give them unlimited time, some of them take unlimited time. And, s and some for a very good reason, and some because there's no reason to go any faster. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the districts that I've talked to, um, the, the time was not an issue okay. for their students. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. For my colleagues who are thinking they want to vote to maintain MCAS. Can you explain what the pluses are to the district and also kind of holistically will we, 
will it push the state to doing a different test or something? Um, I'd just like to hear what, what the rationale is, any of you. Or, or if you just feel like arguing, con mm -hmm. being contrary is ar argument. Who are you asking? Uh, anyone asking, who asking might want to take that position. Uh, of anyone, if you, anyone who'd like to advocate well, for staying on MCAS and, and, and argue that position, why it would be a good thing if the argument is something that Dr. Allison Ampey has expressed an interest in hearing. Um, my two points are, uh, one, that it's a test we already know, and as a teacher, having to do something new for yet another year um, is, you know, it's just another new thing. I mean, I've administered MCAS, I'm, you know, aware of how it is, you know, done all that. Um, the other thing is I kind of feel like, you know, I know that, Mr. Thielman said that he felt like MCAS was a test that didn't count, but I feel like, well, if they're not holding it ac us accountable, PARC is the test that doesn't count, and mm -hmm. I don't really want to have kids take a test that we're not even going to pay attention to, so why take a test at all? Can mm -hmm. we just not test at all for a year? That would be better, <laughs> right? So I don't know. I'm still... Um, and there's still Mitchell Chester, Mitchell Chester, Mitchell mm -hmm. Chester. Mm -hmm. So he comes up all the time and it, yeah. you know. I would just want to build on that. I mean, I, I think my reservation last year, of course I didn't have the opportunity to take such a vote with you guys, but I would have voted for MCAS. Um, and why I'm leaning towards staying with the MCAS this year is precisely because there are n no perceivable differences to me between folks and students taking a test that has already been something they're used to taking and um, the computerized version that we're going to just go computer testing eventually, so we might as well do it now. Um, we like getting the results that we got tonight about our accountability and about our student growth. And I'm not sure that that's going to translate well next year if we go to this test that doesn't have any of that. Um, because it's not, going to be, it's not going to be meaningful. And it's not going to be instructive either because the teachers um, that are already teaching the subjects are, are giving students district-determined measures. The, we've, we've talked about them a lot here. There are, there are internal tests within our district that test student learning and achievement. And while it's not the entire district, it, it, I think it gives a lot of information to teachers about how well the, the students are doing in particular subject areas. So we're already gaining a lot from testing as it is. Another test that is totally new, out of, you know, it, to, to me it doesn't make any sense to do it. But Dr. Seuss. Um, actually, I'm in the fence, so I, but I can tell you the, what would switch me towards MCAS, and I'm on the fence, I have all these reasons for a park as well, <laughs> um, is the thought that there's a chance that the part, uh, MCAS 2.0 is not going to be timed, and so then we would be putting our kids through a time test for one year and then potentially not for the year afterwards. And a similar worry that I actually think MCAS 2.0 is going to be a better quality test because it's going to be more thoughtful, incorporating different things. So I, I suspect Parks is going to be slightly less good of a test. So then again, why put the students through one year of a test that's not quite the right kind of test that we want? Mm -hmm. So those are my, but then I have reasons on the other side. I'm really on the fence. And, and Kiersey. Mr. Uh, Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Kiersey, it's, it, a vote for MCAS isn't a vote to be a contrarian. I think that a vote for MCAS is a vote to, um, in, in some ways, I think, send a message to the state and what they are doing um, on their website. They still don't have us listed as taking the MCAS last year. So, um, they, you know, the, the numbers are skewered to, to show that, oh, more districts took park last year than MCAS. Um, and and what, what Cindy was saying about Mitchell Chester's involvement with the, with the Park Coalition and its ownership and, and uh, benefits there too, I, I, I think it is in part to send a message to the state that there's, lo there's state control that's, that matters to Massachusetts and there's local control um, that really matters to us too. And we're not just going to roll over because you say, oh, we're going to be held harmless for a year or two. And we don't have to go to paper until 2019. Yeah. I don't know. So that's in, an important factor for me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Oh, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Thielman. Well, the, <clears throat> you know, the only thing that I want to uh, just point out that people, we have a week to reflect on this and we'll take a vote, um, is that 
I, I don't know if it's a majority or it's a, it's a split opinion or it's a majority. I don't know what the, I don't really know what the numbers are. Um, there's, there's a number of administrators, principals who would like to administer the park. The principal of the Addison uh, is in favor of the park and his leadership team is in favor of the park because they want to see how they're doing on the Common Core. So I just think that we have to hear that, listen to that. Uh, I like the, um, you know, the school committee takes a vote on whether to do park or MCAS. The district decides how to administer it. That's your job, not ours. Mm -hmm. And so it's good to know that there's some flexibility in the administration. Some, I think I'm hearing that some schools may be able to do it uh, by paper because the faculty and the, and the administrative leadership wants to do it that way and some schools may be doing it electronically because the faculty and administrative leadership wants to do it that way. So in a sense, mm -hmm. even though we're not, <clears throat> you know, it's a state test and we have to take a vote on a state test, there's a considerable amount of, at least for now, for a year or two, there's a considerable amount of local control over how we administer it. Mm -hmm. And there's a desire by local leadership to see how we're doing mm -hmm. uh, against the park standards. So. I think we got to take that into account when we make the make the vote. I think we got to listen to the leadership, and I'm I'm eager to hear what the principals like. Are all eight coming? The high, the middle school. The it's kind of. <coughs> they, 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 I think they're planning on it. Yeah. Because I mean, he already made his opinion pretty clear. So, but I mean, I'm I'm really interested next week. I mean, I, I realize people come in and they do research beforehand. And they make the, up their minds of how they're going to vote, and I and I and I've done that a lot too. But I hope that we have a good dialogue with the principals, and I really want to hear what they're thinking and why they're thinking it next week. And can I just add, I think it's really important to listen to what the teacher said. Mm -hmm. I understand that it's not every teacher that's saying it, but it's certainly an, a lar much larger number than last year. And the principals and, and the administration really took a lot of time, mm -hmm. um, and with Ms. Um, um, Hansen's help, to get input from teachers and, and I would like you to also take that into consideration what the teachers feel and I, I know it must be really hard to be in your position but I, I would like to just echo what Mr. Thielman says mm -hmm. that, that if you would please listen to the the administrators if you would please listen to what the teachers are saying and and that you would give that as much forget us mm -hmm. but the other administrators um, and really give that as much weight as possible and I also just for the chair I hope we get enough time, on the, I know you do, mm -hmm. to give us enough time, but I want to just make sure there's enough time on the agenda so we have a good dialogue with these yeah. folks. Yeah. yeah. So I just thought, I mean, we will I, take the time we need to talk about this. Good. That's all. Thank you very much. I, I also have to state that uh, from my position, uh, two things. One of the, the, the most persuasive argument may have uh, been very subtle, but is hugely persuasive. It's that the whole process and the personnel required to administer paper MCAS at the Odyssey is substantial and I think that the principal understated it that he's accounting for 1135 test booklets 1135 answer sheets uh, a, a corresponding number of uh, teacher manuals and other uh, pieces of paper that are shipped back to New Hampshire uh, and each and every one is counted and has to be accounted for and one missing document at some place uh, creates havoc and that to manage this paper flow is hugely disrupt, uh, disruptive to his staff and that happens twice. That happens in, in the end of March, beginning of April for ELA, it happens again in May for uh, mathematics, so that you've got two very disruptive testing windows and the discussion that he put forth is that people who uh, service kids for the most part and are diverted to accounting for and administering MCAS uh, would be able to be working with kids during those extended periods rather than being uh, hung up in testing in Ministrivia. Uh, you know, Mitchell Chester is not my friend, and, and, and I'm certainly not going to go and vote for something because he wants it, but I don't think that it's particularly a wise move to vote against something that, that's in the best interest of the district because you want to send a message to Mr. Mitchell Chester. I can do that effectively through other means, and I think we all can. 
Um, if we wanted to have a vote of no confidence in the uh, commissioner, we could do that effectively and send that off, and I think that would be a far more effective way to send that message than to do that through the testing decision. Uh, no question in my mind that the MCAS is obsolete. It was crafted a long time ago. Uh, uh, several components of the test are not statistically relevant. Uh, for example, the long comp really doesn't differentiate much of anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're wasting a lot of time doing that. There's some talk about eliminating that in the, uh, in the 2016 administration. I don't know if they do. They should. They haven't made a decision. They haven't made the decision, but I know that there, there's been that chatter coming about. Um, Paper and pen pencil, obsolete, uh, multiple choice, lots of statistical error. Uh, moving towards a computerized test is a better instrument, just by definition. Uh, moving away out of paper and pencil, moving to something that's more authentic and aligned to the common core uh, is an advantage because that's how we're teaching. Um, I think that you know, we're going to get data back from either instrument. We can't abandon testing. We have to choose one or the other. Uh, schools that have gotten park data have gotten a rich set of data that's going to help them with teaching and learning in their district. Uh, just as skilled people who are looking at MCAS data can tease stuff out. Um, the fact is, is we are moving towards a hybrid in which there are park-like questions that are going to be administered by the state. Pearson will not be the uh, entity that will be dealing with it will be a separate state contract uh, and so the Pearson issue and having the consortium define what we're doing is is being removed from from the process um, and it will give everybody the experience of taking a look at the data that aligns to the new test yeah we're going to be held harmless but the data will still be out there and published just as it is now I, I don't really see an advantage of staying put on MCAS uh, is park perfect? No. Um, but I, and if we were going to park paper universally, I don't think that I'd really see a compelling argument uh, to make such a, such a move right now. But I think the, the sooner we move to a computer-based assessment tool, the better it is for the district, certainly the better it is for the middle school. They clearly have told us in the past two meetings that they'd much prefer to go to the park computer-based test it would make it a lot easier to run that school uh, through, uh, through the spring. And I, I, I view that as a very, very compelling argument. Paul, one point I want, just yeah, want, Mr. Thielman. want to make. Thank you, Paul. Uh, <clears throat> is um, the, you know, policymakers make decisions based on all sorts of different biases. You know, well, how our kids feel about a mm -hmm. test, mm -hmm. how we feel professionally about a mm -hmm. test, how we felt when we were kids about a test. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you know different constituents say so you know that's how we make decisions and that and that's the way it works but the one thing I, I would just want people to think about is you know the, the this is the easy part of mm -hmm. education a bunch of policymakers mm -hmm. sitting in a room taking a mm -hmm. vote mm -hmm. we walk out and people have to do the work in the, mm -hmm. in the schools and that's the hard part mm -hmm. and the majority of the administrators not all of them seem to be saying that the hard work of getting teachers and students to work and act differently could be or would be or likely would be helped by the park test. That's what I heard in the survey. They feel that that test will help them change the way people teach and the way students learn. Um, and, you know, we got to, we got to kind of step away from our biases, unblend ourselves from our biases. And hear and just listen to that next mm -hmm. week. That's what I would just say. Just listen to that because mm -hmm. that's what I'm really test. That's what I'm asking. Do you believe that this tool is going to help you help teachers to improve their practice? Not that they're not doing it anyway. Um, and is it going to help you to help students learn better and differently, and in a way aligned with the new standards? That's the question I'm going to ask, and we'll see how they answer it. Mr. Pierce. And I would just say that that voice that you're mm -hmm. hearing the people who are so strongly saying that Park is going to be the test that's gonna improve student learning and achievement. Those same voices will say, on the other hand, mm -hmm. blah, 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 mm -hmm. with a different audience in front of them, with a different question or asking the same question a different way. They're here in front of Dr. Chesson and Dr. Bodie. 
They're here <laughs> as agents of the school district. Um, we are not expecting of them to take such a contrary view in front of their bosses and in front of the public. But in private conversations, you might hear a different answer to those same questions. Well, and I'm not saying that anyone is being disingenuous. I'm saying that there's an equal part concern, an equal part um, relevancy of the MCAS that, that I think you guys are just saying, oh, it's antiquated, it's the Titanic, it's a sinking ship, and we can't do anything about it. No, we can do something about it. We can, we, we've been continuing to learn from it and just tonight talk about it. It's not, it's not, it's not irrelevant any, you know. So I would just say that the same folks that you're talking with, the same folks that they've talked uh, to the school committee last week are the same folks that will say, on the other hand, you know, blah, 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 so. Well, I mean, I, okay, I, I don't know how to measure that, but I, I would just say that, um, <clears throat> well, we'll see. I mean, we'll see if all eight principals are saying the same thing or if they're saying different things. And that'll be, that'll be a way to test that, test your position, right? Because if we have eight people up there and five. But this isn't one, the best environment for them yeah, to say their full true. mind. This isn't the best environment for that. And you have to take, I think, personal anecdotes or personal conversations, personal emails into account, not just the bodies in this room for two hours, three hours on a school committee night. And that's, that's the edict and that's what they want. I think there's a lot more variance and a lot more gray here than outside of this chamber. I, I think that uh, Ms. Hansen, and I'm gonna ask her to come back and make a final comment because she is our AE8 rep and normally has a seat at the table. But I've never known Ms. Hansen to do anything else but give us the, a straight position as to what she sees is happening out there. Uh, and I never heard a principal come here and forcefully make a statement in favor of something they don't really believe in. And I don't think that the superintendent would put them in that position where, in, uh, where she would expect them to toe a party line when we're trying to, to ask questions and obtain facts and opinions. Uh, I expect our school leaders to follow the directive of the committee once we make a decision that we are entitled to make. But at this point, we have not made a decision. Uh, we are soliciting opinions. And I think that the folks who have come before us have been forthright in their opinions, and I expect that to happen again next week. Ms. Hansen, would you come forward again? Be happy to. <clears throat> You've, you've heard the discussion, you've heard uh, the, the middle school principal, you've heard everything else that's happened tonight. You made a statement in public participation. Would you like to comment further? I think it's a difficult decision and I think both, I think both decisions honestly are equally problematic mm -hmm. and equally potentially useful. I, you know, I think we're, we're kind of making a decision within a, a, a really closed environment here. And I think some of the bigger questions, Mr. Pierce said, if I, you know, can, if you really want to hold harmless, we should vote for no test at all. You know, that is, that's part of a conversation that's going on out there. Um, so I think the fact is as a district, we have to make a choice between two imperfect, um, things here. You know, I, a year and a half ago, I was very much pro st stick with MCAS. I think the whole park thing was very problematic for all of the reasons that people have talked about. Losing state control over it, sending it to this multi-state consortium. It's a new test no matter what it has problems. It's going to need a couple years to smooth itself out just like the MCAS did. I I'm completely believe that. Meanwhile, we have a four-year trajectory that we're headed towards in 2019. I think a lot will happen between now and then, and I honestly hope that this is only scratching the surface of our school committee and our administration and our teachers' interest in the kind of state testing we want, the amount of state testing we want, the amount of standardized testing we want, how much time we want it to take, whether it's timed or not, so I really hope this is just the beginning of the conversation. So I started out this second round personally, 
thinking we should just stick with the MCAS. Honestly, when you weigh all of the factors back and forth, I come out really mixed myself. So I've kind of taken the stand through this, these last couple weeks that, you know, I, I have more theoretical interests in one and philosophical interests in one test over the other. But where I've come down is that I feel like this is a perfect example of a educational policy decision where I think teachers should have a significant say in it. And just the conversations that they're having with each other and having with their administrators about testing are, you know, to me, that's really what the interesting thing about what's happening right now. In the end, the kids are gonna have to take a test. Eight-year-olds are gonna have to take a test. They're gonna have to sit for five days, five mornings. Some of them are gonna be stressed out. Some of them are gonna be crying. It's the world, it's the educational world we live in right now. If that's not something that we like to think about, we should think about changing that. But, you know, honestly, if they're gonna sit for MCAS or if they're gonna sit for PARC this year, me personally, I feel like it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I, I, I do think a good case can be made for both. And I think some of the, the reasons that you've all stated some of the things you've heard from the administrators, some of the things you've heard from the teachers in our district and from ELA directors and, and coaches and coordinators in other districts, they're all valid. And it's kind of like, where do you come down? Where do you come down with your own values about testing? Where do you come down with, you know, kind of what you want to put kids through? So again, I really feel like the attitude we have going into this is really important. Um, you know, Mr. Pierce, you talked about while we're having this test, what, you know, we're all excited about hold harmless. You know, <laughs> Mr. Thielman, you talked about the, the parents on the playground talking about, wow, you know, two years of no accountability. Like, that, that sounds pretty good. But at the same time, you were talking about how much interest people had on the stats and figures and becoming level one. Dr. Chesson, you know, kind of said, these PPIs are really volatile year, year from year, like, be careful what you wish for, like, yep, congratulations this year, but you don't know where you're gonna be next year. So, you know, I feel like to me the more important question is how much stock we're putting in these numbers in the first place, what kind of value we're ascribing them. I think accountability is important. I think every single teacher in, in Arlington would say, we wanna be accountable. You know, you would be surprised. 18 years now, many of our teachers have never taught in an era where there wasn't a standardized test to kind of hang your hat on. They want to know how well their kids are doing. They, like, really, you know, grab that information when they get it, and they look through it, and they want to know, and they want to compare. And when I sit down and do data analysis and instruction meetings with them, they say to me, who does this really well in the district? I want to know what they're doing. They're not, you know, they're competitive in a good way. And they say, if somebody knows how to do this better, like, tell me, like, I want to talk to them. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just feel like you asked me, you know, to, to get back up here so I'm, I have the opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would encourage you to read through the comments of the teachers, again, with the new information, because I, I, again, I asked them not just what, but why. What were the factors that you thought were important to you? And, and I think teachers talked about their comfort and their discomfort with something new, their comfort with what they knew, but a lot of them talked about stress on kids. But there are different kinds of stress you know, with a new test, there are different kinds of stress with a long composition, which can take all day. So, you know, I really, I, I think it's important that you think about why you're deciding whatever you're deciding. And I think it's important that you validate teachers' opinions who took the time to really think about this and discuss it, not just with their set themselves, amongst themselves, but also with their administrator. We want schools that do that, that think school cultures and climates that where people are really, their opinions matter, they're taken seriously. Um, so I guess that's my two cents for now. Thank you. Can, 
Uh, Dr. Okay. Allison Ampey? May I ask Don't a question? Don't go away, Wait. Linda. <laughs> <laughs> May I direct a question through the chair? Please do. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this, and it's difficult, so you'll have to work with me. How well do you think, if we try and send a message that we don't want people to fret about this test if we switch to PARC, mm -hmm. especially if we went electronic, how well do you think that message will come, will, will be received? You know, will they just say, well, they're saying that, but, you know, really they want the good results and so. so. So I think that's a really good question and I think you would have to say it on day one and if that's a reason why you're choosing, for instance, to go with PARC, it should be fully stated when, when people vote it mm -hmm. and I think it needs to be, you should, you know, set up appointments with the reporters of The Advocate and whatever, you know, kind of other media outlets. I think the administration has to be very clear with teachers and principals from day one. I think you have to look at your district goals for the next two years and think about how they reflect or don't reflect to focus on those numbers and that test. I mean, I think it's something that you would have to communicate and message over and over again. Um, but I, 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 think it's, I think it's possible. You know, again, talking to other districts that did that, it seems like the message, what you, was, they were able to get that message across, that it really was a very low stakes trial. Could you tell me other districts that did that? And, I mean, off, offline. And, and I, I'm, I'm actually giving you copies of my notes okay, that, that, has, mm -hmm. that have it in there, but we could talk about, yeah, we could talk okay. about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, I, actually, I want to ask a general question of Dr. Cheshire, and you presented this last time, but just to remind everyone, um, how many days, how many hours each test, you know, sort of, mm -hmm. just to get a picture of what it looks like. Um, for PARC or for both tests? I guess both. for both, for both. Um, the MCAS test um, uh, has two sessions, one session that's in March, which is two, uh, one, uh, one te uh, two testing windows. Um, one testing window uh, that is in March that has two sessions of 60 minutes each, um, and then um, ma um, and then has a session of math in uh, in the May time frame. Um, in Park, um, there there's one window, um, and the minutes. It, it, she, for me to give you this to you verbally is not going to be right, helpful because okay. there's just too many numbers here for me. Okay. Mm. Just to say that there's one window for Park. There are two win min windows for MCAS. If we add up the minutes, they're slightly over, but that one of the reasons the minutes are slightly over is because they add time onto the park testing session mm -hmm. so that kids who need extra time can take that extra time. So how many mornings, I guess, or how many afternoons, how many days, physical days? I, I know that there are time tests and there's only um, yeah, I'm not sure. Do you, grades three, it's different it's every different, grade because okay. one grade has okay. this one. It's in the presentation that was given the no, last time. No, I do time. remember. You I just wanted. Look, okay. I, 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 I do that. remember. Doctor Chesson, yes. could you resend that presentation to everybody? I, I will. I will. I, yes, I will. I'll send it to Karen, and Karen will send it out to you. Yeah. Thank you. And I actually, we um, we have um, more detailed information about what a schedule would look like if we did it online, what a schedule would look like oh, good. if That'd we did great. it on paper. I will send that out. I, I knew you were voting next week, so right. my, it was my intention to send that out on, you know, so that you would have it for next week. So will you have that? Yeah, if you could just get it like in before yes. the yes. Thursday. Yep. So no, 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 you, you'll get it tomorrow. I have it. it awesome. I just held it back so that you would have it in a Thank timely you. fashion and it wouldn't disappear as things do in my email. Dr. Allison Ampey. I know this is ironic given I just said we're not going to care about the test, but I did look through your other presentation and we didn't get SGPs for the special, for the Oh, uh, all right, I can needs. send that out to you, yes. Yeah. Thank it's, you. If you need it before, I can no. send it out to you. No, it's it's available on the Department of Education website. It, it's something I know, it's, it's just, it's something I think we should be keeping an eye on in the setting that we're looking at the test. If we have a test we're not worried about, then what? Sure, I'll send that out to you. Right. Um, Ms. Hansen. Can I just say one thing r related to what um, Dr. Allison Ampey was just saying? So less than 50% of the um, districts took MCAS last year. I, I think that number will diminish again this year. So maybe, I don't know, maybe 25% of the state will take the MCAS, who knows? The way that they're making the equivalence between the MCAS and the park <laughs> is they're using something called the equipercentile. Maybe Ms. Starks can explain it. 
I don't know, but you know, they're, or, they're basically just taking the results of one test and the results of another and like plugging them in like this. And there's a chart you can see on the DESI website that shows how to do it. Honestly, I think it's kind of problematic in terms of, you know, kind of shifting from one complete test to a totally different test. That will take a couple years to shake out too. Mm -hmm. So I think even just the fact that you're now starting to compare, you know, normally there are like 70,000 kids at one grade level that take the test. This year there were like 35,000. So you're already comparing yourselves against, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to even go down further. Mm -hmm. So I don't think honestly that that comparison, comparability to stay with MCAS personally is not something that I think is, mm -hmm. I just think everything's going to be up in the air for the next couple of years. So mm -hmm. I, to me, I think because the numbers are shrinking so much and changing so much and, and new tests comparing to an old test, different groups of kids taking them, yeah. I just want to say that seems problematic to me. We were fortunate this year in that it split 50-50 and that demographically the Park schools and the MCAS schools tended to look alike so that there wasn't a real difference between the two groups. So it wasn't a major issue equating, but the reliability and validity of the MCAS data next year if we go to 25% of the districts taking it, you lose the compared to what and that's really the important part of the equation. Right, that was, that was kind of my point. And to be held accountable for a test that's only being taken by 25% of the population becomes even more statistically problematic. And you can have results that don't make statistics, statistical sense because of the diminishing numbers of students taking that exam. Okay. So I think you could have other reasons. There are other valid reasons. I'm not sure that's one, mm -hmm. though. Yeah, uh, Dr. Seuss. I have another question. Um, uh, potentially for Dr. Schlesinger, potentially for um, Ms. Elmer, um, I, uh, I know that there's a potential in the future on the computer-based test to um, make accommodations more easily. Um, I was wondering what about the status of the paper-based test? Are there concerns there for kids who need accommodations? They're the same accommodations that have always been available, but Alice. Yeah, no, um, with the exception of for the park, there was <laughs> two that are kind of significant with the untimed mm -hmm. portion, which the MCAS was untimed for all <laughs> students. Um, and then that would, um, Ms. Hansen mentioned that earlier that, you know, there would need to be made some accommodations to IEPs, student IEPs, but not for this year because there's a, a, a blanket blank. waiver for people who would be switching over. I see. Um, and then there's a few things around graphic organizers and whatnot um, that, people are used to, it's a standard accommodation on the MCAS, it's not a standard, or it's not an available accommodation on the park, however, should they eventually go to that MCAS 2.0, the, the assumption is that they're doing that so we can get some of those accommodations that we're used to having. So, um, but if we went to park next year, would there be any problem because they would not have a tool that they're used to dealing, kids are used to dealing with, or? Um, it's, the graphic organizer is actually um, up, an actual copy of one, but really if best practice is to teach a student to create their own graphic organizer, that helps them. So I mean, that wouldn't prevent them from doing that. Got it. Um, okay. You know, it's, you have to submit the graphic organizer that you would use anyway, so for the MCAS. So I don't foresee the lack of a graphic organizer as a particularly um, problematic one. I think the untimed piece is something that, you know, people are concerned about. Right, right. Okay, okay great, thanks. Anything else? Hearing none. We are committed to talking about this as much as we need to, and we'll be back at it next week. Monthly financials, uh, Ms. Johnson. Good evening. There, with the exception of the elevator, which we all hope will be ready next week, um, and that it's costing more than we last projected, as you saw in my letter. Um, hopefully not as much as we've encumbered, but significantly more. It's been a very expensive project. Um, we're pretty much where we were. Mm -hmm. Any questions to the Chief Financial Officer? Hearing none, that was the easiest one you've <laughs> ever had to deliver. Have we, um, I also uploaded uh, the larger file from some of the presentations you heard tonight. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions on that that I can answer? 
You were about to get away, uh, Dr. <laughs> Seuss. I'm trying to be helpful. Uh, yeah, just actually this question about the dean at the high school. I know that you had mentioned that there was another position that was maybe playing the role of the director of guidance position. The director of guidance position, and that so on the Mr. Janger's um, request, he would like both. Is that right? It seems so. Okay, <laughs> so, so I clarify that. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Hearing none. Thank wait, you very much. Wait, oh, go ahead, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm not sure if this is for the superintendent or, or for Ms. Johnson. Um, will we get a list from the high school? Well, actually, Dr. Jang, you said he was going to hand us out something, but it, oh, you've got it. There okay. is a narrative point by point that was completed today, but we didn't bring it forward because we couldn't get it out two days ago. We just finished it today, but it will number every ask and it will have a narrative backup for each ask okay. on the sheet. And it'll be from, it'll be the asks that they gave us this this It'll evening. be the original asks. Right, right. That, that's what, okay, yes. thank you. Uh, um, can we send those out tomorrow? Well, tomorrow we have an administrative ah. team meeting and we're going to go over all of them and see mm -hmm. if there's anything that they would want to add. Mm -hmm. Right now it's very, add. quite a quite a dense document. <laughs> it, it's 12 pages long, the narrative with, you know, and we, we wanted to write it this year, and I have to give Julie Dunn a huge shout out for all the work she's done on it under a very short time frame. Um, we really wanted them to be standalone documents because one of the critiques I've heard that's hard for me to get in my head all the time, I'm very comfortable, I'm more comfortable running down a spreadsheet than running down a narrative, but that's not true for many people. And so we wanted to make the narrative a very much a standalone document. So if you're going back and forth, you'll see a lot of redundancies. But for those who prefer to see it only in narration, they can read the whole thing and get the whole story. So that, that's a big change, but it's an enormous amount of work. And, and Ms. Dunn needs a lot of credit for all the work she did on that. Mm -hmm. OK. Superintendent's Thank you. report. All right. Some of these we've had already. Um, one thing I actually wanted to bring up because it was in the Globe on Sunday and it was an article, I believe it was actually on the front page, talking about asbestos mm -hmm. and uh, some concerns in some districts that they, or some schools, that asbestos is not abated in the best practice manner. And what I wanted to say tonight, that that is not the case in the Arlington Public Schools. When we have identified, uh, we have any kind of renovation that requires movement of an encapsulated uh, tile or piping or whatever, that we, that we have strong suspicions of having asbestos, we go through um, the best practice methodology for doing that. And whenever possible, try not to do it when um, we have students in the building. And I, and I would ask Ms. Johnson, because she's usually the person who is um, the person who oversees this, if you want to add any more comments about that. Because we've had, we've had things happen over the last few years and um, certainly have done our very best to make sure that it's done the right way. In the capital budget, we've carried, carried $5,000 a year for asbestos abatement every year since I've been here and into the future of the plan. In general, asbestos tile, where not broken, poses no health risk. The, the real problem with asbestos is when it's broken and becomes friable, or for people that are working with it, putting it in, taking it out, developing it. So we keep that $5,000 there. So if in one of the few remaining places we find a broken tile, we can hire the abatement and get it done right away. And mm -hmm. we're very careful about that. We have been chipping away at it, pun intended, um, <laughs> to get most of it out of the district. With the renovations, um, you know, that there's, there's two pieces. I don't want to bore you to death, but in any event, we're staying on top of it. Um, the high school is really the last big reservoir of such tile, not surprisingly, given its age. Mm -hmm. Let's knock it down. <laughs> <laughs> Let's build a new one. Let's build a new one. Yeah, build a new high school. Let's solve all our problems. Um, uh, continue, uh, Dr. I don't really have too much more. Um, we, uh, it's hard to believe that we are on the edge of the winter season as we've lived through this week, but we are. And I will be uh, sending out a notice to parents, but just reminding them that it, while we put a lot of time into it, and I have to talk about we, that's DPW, 
the early morning phone calls and a lot of conversation across districts, um, a lot of thought goes into it. But sometimes the weather can change after the decision is made um, and parents have to use their best judgment. The, I think in general, I would say that, you know, snow levels of three to four inches, and I say this as a general statement, are probably not going to require a snow day. Um, we, now, that could be changed depending on how, already how much snow is on the ground or how icy it is. There's a lot of other things that can, could, um, could impact that. But in general, I think that uh, we have right now a very, uh, our end date for the school year is June 29th. Um, now, for each snow day, we have to put five snow days on the calendar. We can back that up. Now, am I going to make a decision that's going to in any way uh, be uh, considered poor judgment in terms of what the conditions are? The safety is the most important thing, but sometimes, and I, I can even think of an instance last year where there was a surprise. Uh, it, it, things happened that the weathermen hadn't even talked about it at four in the morning. So, uh, th those, that will happen. So. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, it's time to get the galoshes bought and put by the door and um, we try to have students be in school. Certainly one of the most important things in education is being there. Mm -hmm. But um, if a parent really feels that they can't get out of the driveway, there's some reason why they, they can't, it will be an excused absence. But um, at the same time, it's something that um, we take very seriously, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm confident the parents do too, the wanting their children to be there. Um, we, well, actually, I don't, we, we really touched on a, a few things, but the one thing I did want to mention, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of activities that go on in the school system. There's a concert at the high school tomorrow night. We've had a concert at Odison. There are all of those which parents note, um, note. and I would say to people who are listening tonight, one of the things we have updated on our website is our calendar. So you can actually go into the calendar by day and see what all the different activities are going on. But one I wanted to point out, because we're in the uh, holiday season, and um, the AHS is going to have the Christmas Carol next week. And so if you're looking for an activity with your children, I would, I would highly suggest it. So it's um, it's going to be on at 7.30 on December 18th and on 7.30 on the 19th, but on the 19th, there is going to be an 11 a.m. performance. And this is actually a very, a very unique one. It's, um, they're, they're going to make it uh, sensitive to children with autism <coughs> disorder. And so that might be something that parents might want to consider because often some productions may be too uh, loud or whatever that might be that would might make it difficult. So anyway, we have that happening at the high school next, next week and I would encourage people to, to buy some tickets. Um, uh, yeah, just um, <laughs> Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Yes. Pierce. Love to add, my, my son who's a sixth grader is performing in that w as Tiny Tim. Mm -hmm. And I saw the tail end of it today. They were rehearsing an old hall because I guess there was something else happening in the auditorium. But um, if you bring a, a canned good or non-perishable mm -hmm. food item, you can get $2 off your ticket admission. So instead of 10 bucks, it'll be $8 for a ticket. And uh, there'll be four performances. Excellent. Yeah. Looks well, good. So you'll, be, you'll be at all four, right? Oh, yeah. With <laughs> <laughs> the camera. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Super. By the way, the November newsletter went out today so there's a lot of great things in going on right now uh, consent agenda uh, all items listed with an asterisk are considered considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion there will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence approval of warrant number 16077 November 19th, uh, warrant amount $760,431.79, and approval of draft minutes November 12th and November 19th. Mr. Pierce. I'm going to pull those. Uh, we will pull the minutes. So uh, basically the consent agenda is one 
Item again, uh, the warrant. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That is unanimous. Uh, on the approval of the minutes of November 12th and 19th, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Move to approve. Uh, aye. Opposed? Uh, and with Mr. Pierce abstaining. Subcommittee and liaison reports, policies and procedures. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had a good meeting on December 7th. Uh, we discussed two, well, three items of merit. Uh, the BEDB file, which was our um, um, file concerning the, come on, remind me. Someone. Agenda, <laughs> agenda. Agenda, agenda format preparation oh, agenda. and dissemination. <laughs> it was such an entertaining meeting in the morning that I somehow <laughs> forgot that BEDB file. Poor um, Frank. <laughs> we discussed whether or not we were going to actually uh, come back to you with revisions or um, in the alternative, ask to see if we could just trial practice with Ms. Fitzgerald's great help and um, uh, approval, uh, a system where we can get documents into the system by Friday. So we have the weekend to review them and look at them rather than having everything due by Tuesday. We'd like to try that as a school committee and see if that works over the next three to four months and if that does indeed work for us and work for work for Mr. Fitzgerald and everyone else who has to load this stuff in we could revise the policy accordingly can we under the context obviously we would be uh, I, I don't think it would be a, a policy violation to put things in early no. but the policy item of uh, not opening the documentation to to the public until the time of the meeting if we were to do that early would that be a problem not at all i think that would be in line with us mm -hmm. getting the stuff earlier too because there's nothing in um, mm -hmm. uh, our obligations to even give our materials to the public it's just the agenda that needs to be posted so the fact that we give the materials and make them available for the public here or even electronically is in in exceeding what is our obligation under the under the law in terms of uh, people have right to access it but we're making it easier making but, it easier correct yeah um but i think that it's something that we should be doing i think that the selectmen have actually it's sort of embarrassing the selectmen are doing better than we are at this. <gasps> no no they're, they're getting it out early you can see the uh, backup documentation a couple of days in advance and actually make a decision uh -oh. whether you want to go and complain to the selectmen about something <laughs> they're about to do before they actually do it. It's, it's, it, it's kind of cool. Yeah. So, um, so I guess what we're saying here is with the consent of the committee, we will take the uh, proposed uh, changes and implement them as a trial to see how they work out and that if things are working, we will adjust the policy to conform to our new reality. Precisely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the other things we discussed at our meeting uh, had to do with our kindergarten admissions and age. Um, we, we seemingly talk about this every year because it is something that comes up every year um, with our cutoff date of age five at kindergarten, age six uh, mm -hmm. by September 1st in first grade. Um, and I think it's the consensus of the subcommittee um, to leave the policy as mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. for, for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. and. The one suggestion and change that I'll be making and, and uh, having the subcommittee look over and then ultimately bring mm -hmm. before all of you is some sort of preamble statement at the very top of the policy explaining how and where we've looked at, at resources mm -hmm. and, and looked at other districts and how we've arrived at that sharp cutoff date um, and why it's important for this district to have it. Uh, sort of a historical background, if you will, but, but brief mm -hmm. um, to put the top. And then we, we, we talked to MCAS and Park because that might ultimately be a policy uh, de decision for us. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we talked about uh, the pros and cons like we did today mm -hmm. of those two tests. So um, we're going to meet on January 11th at 8.15 in the morning, hopefully in our regular room uh, and not in the guidance room. We'll be <laughs> upstairs, hopefully. We'll see. Um, and that's all we have to report. Uh, the electronic signatures are on the uh, summary. Uh, where are we on that? Um, we're, we're not quite resolved on that yet. Mm -hmm. we, we seem to think that the, it, there is permission for us to be able to do that mm -hmm. um, from looking at the MASC listserv. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all the research that I've 
I've done on that specific issue. Has MASC provided a sample policy that would permit that? Possibly. I, I Perhaps we should uh, ask, ask them for a revised policy that would incorporate the uh, electronic signatures. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bode. Well, well, since the policy subcommittee meeting, uh, I've talked to our controller, mm -hmm. and he wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. So he's looking into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that he's had experience with uh, previously, and so th there'll be. So yeah, nobody's had experience yeah. with this. Yeah. But I just uh, mm -hmm. sold a house, and mm -hmm. all of the documents were signed electronically. Mm -hmm. It's pretty wild. I, yeah. I did that you get to pick your own font, you mm -hmm. make your own yeah. signature, and then um, it's all like directed only at you, and yeah. only mm -hmm. you can sign it, and then that's your signature. My husband had to get his own, and mm -hmm. so it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, you know, cool. And mm -hmm. we saw on the MASC serve mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. some districts had moved to that. And just to be clear, it's the warrants that we sign here in person yeah. every time this we thing. meet. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and that uh, we have to chase people for when we're away. In the right. summer, right, right, right. Away, it yeah. would allow us when we're not together to get the signatures. What about other things that need to be signed? For example, you have um, to sign uh, payroll. Uh, I or, don't Or Mr. Hayner uh, signs. The, the, I don't know. We, we don't know. The, the yeah. policy we were brought down was electronic signatures for for warrant. account payable warrant. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the one thing was mentioned. I mean, if there are other things we can do electronically, that would be a benefit. Okay. That'll be on the agenda on the 11th. Okay, cool. cool. Budget. Budget also had a good meeting on December 7th in the afternoon. Um, and we are again bringing forward the Pierce Field fee um, for your perusal and, and I hope approval. Um, the committee had moved at the previous meeting to present the revised Pierce Field fees schedule um, for the school committee to approve on a trial basis for about the next six months, um, except we didn't have the documentation. You have the documentation today. Um, we haven't got any updates on that since then. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey, then, are you making a motion? I am. Go ahead. For the school committee to approve the revised Pierce Field fee schedule as presented by the administration. Uh, moved by Dr. Yeah, Allison Ampey. On a trial, base, uh, on a trial by basement for six months. Dr. Seuss. Uh, any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Um, where we, were you yesterday at 5.30? Mm -hmm. You can tell. Uh, I want to say that the uh, Arlington Cable, ACME, ACMI, uh, when not dropping anvils on roadrunners and <laughs> uh, delivering packages to coyotes, they run a really nice cable operation. Um, I'm getting kicked from under the table by the guy from ACMI. They hate it when you call them ACME, but uh, they had a show last night that was focused on budget and numbers and uh, our esteemed chair of the budget subcommittee joined me in this and she did a wonderful job. She has such a command of details and facts. It's, it's a blessing to have her on the committee. Um, facilities, Cindy Starks. It will be nice to be back. Yeah. Um, and so uh, one of the things, a lot of uh, interesting information, I think, has come out of the Enrollment Task Force. Um, and we have had a lot of deliverables. Um, and uh, so I just, I put together kind of a quick uh, PowerPoint, which you guys have. Um, some of this was given to uh, the Enrollment Task Force as well. Um, let's see, how do I make it? Did I just hit enter? Oh, good. Um, so uh, we started by explaining to them what the needs were. I think that most of you already know this. Uh, this is just kind of breaks it down. Uh, I have a slide for the needs at the elementary school. Um, we're looking to need about 17 to 20 elementary classrooms over the next five years. Um, in the Audison, come on, 
Oh, oh no, I skipped one. How do I go back? Huh? Oh. Okay, middle school. Uh, also, uh, over the next five years, we're looking at needing another 20 classrooms at the middle school. Um, and again, this just outlines kind of how we get to those numbers, 14 regular, 16 specialists. In addition, um, once you have all those new classrooms, we need more gym space, more lunchroom space, more administrative space. Um, so it's more than, than just the classrooms. Um, and of course, at the high school, I don't want to leave it out. <laughs> um, we need to rebuild the high school. Uh, we know we're all waiting for that 21st date. Um, so uh, hopefully, here we go, right? Um, and uh, just, I, I put that on there that the MSBA will be involved in this and to stay at the top of the list for the high school. Obviously, I just, we always need to say this, but any other renovations are all on our dime mm -hmm. because we can't ask MSBA for money as long as we're waiting on the high school. Um, so the, there are four big questions that we uh, feel like in order to help make our decision and move our decisions forward that we feel like we need to have answered. Um, and it's, these are questions that we need to kind of talk about tonight and come up with what we think. But we also, um, on January 7th, have the forum uh, that um, Community Relations is going to put on, and it will be co-sponsored by the uh, school enrollment task force um, they voted that uh, last night um, to help get input on these big questions from the town and voters as well so the first one is elementary neighborhood schools how important are they uh, what is the definition of a neighborhood like for example could neighborhood be Hardy and Thompson are they a neighborhood together um, uh, so, you know, kind of trying to put our heads around uh, what that means to people um, and also what, you know, is it possible to just redistrict to put students where the classrooms are, right? We have classrooms. We don't have enough. We still don't have enough, but we do have some um, and, you know, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of wild and crazy ideas thrown out at the school enrollment task force. I think that that has frustrated some people. They're like, I can't believe you're talking about that. Um, and other people, you know, I just feel like we're just, we're just putting everything we can out on the table, no matter how crazy. Um, but, you know, one possibility is do a massive redistricting and move kids where the classrooms are and save some money for a while. Um, you know, I don't really know how much this helps and for how long. I, d I don't think that we have enough classrooms to really make a difference in the short term, but, you know, all of these things kind of need to be thought about. Um, the second big question that we need to ask is what size we want our middle school to be. Um, as you heard, um, you know, when uh, Mr. Uh, Jerry, sorry, um, uh, got up and spoke today, we are now, the, we are the seventh largest in the state. Um, we are starting to, you know, catch up to our high school, um, and we have to decide, are we going to make it big and own it and just teach the stuff out of it? <laughs> um, or are we going to break it up somehow? Um, that's kind of a really big question that we need to answer, um, and uh, we, we should probably have that discussion here. A lot of people um, at the School Enrollment Task Force are really interested in what are the important pedagogy input from the school mm -hmm. committee about these questions. I mean, you know, it's an interesting meeting. We have Al and um, Al Tosti and uh, uh, Charlie Foskett are there kind of from finance and, and you know, capital planning. Um, and so they talk numbers at us and, and we talk, you know, practices back at them. And, and then the poor selectmen are trying to figure out like what they're supposed to be doing. And it's kind of interesting meeting. Um, it's great to have all those minds there together because you know, we have to have these discussions just like that. Um, and then also, if we do break up the middle school uh, or if we try to do something about the middle school, what grade level should we keep together? Do we want to have just one? You know, uh, uh, you know we have to kind of have some discussion around uh, what, what we think about that. Um, the fourth, uh, the third big question is class size and teacher load. Um, I'm trying to redefine it from class size to teacher load mm -hmm. because we all know that not all students are equal. They have, mm -hmm. their age is important, their needs are important, um, whether that be financial needs um, or academic needs, uh, whether they're ELL, whether they have special needs. 
Um, we need to define what we think is educationally sound. We have to think about what we can afford, how do we define it, um, and we just need to know what people want to do. Um, I've been trying really hard. I've been playing with a formula that tries to get to something where we can define what we think is an acceptable teacher load. Um, and uh, I, I'm working with um, Sanson on that actually more uh, this week. So hopefully we'll have something that we can bring forward. Um, and then the second part of that is not just what is teacher load that is acceptable, but what are we going to do when we exceed that? Because it's going to happen, even in our best case, right? Even if we were to do all this building, if the town continues to grow, we'll be in this position at some point again. And I just want to make sure that we always say, okay, you know, we can say that, you know, 30 kids in a classroom, we're going to add a teacher and then we're never going to let it get to 40 or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, like, but there's, there's definitely could be different steps to mitigate what we think is acceptable teacher load. Um, and obviously there is some point when that actually has to be another classroom, but um, we need to kind of define those. Um, and the last big question that we, wanted to get answered and they wanted our input on it also is town impact. Um, we know it's going to cost money. We have to build something. We have to do something about the enrollment issues. Um, and I think that one of the things that we are all aware of is that we want to build somewhere. Well, where can we do that? Where's the smallest impact on the other priorities the town has, whether it's arts or other programs or whatever, um, we do want to make sure that we keep all of that in mind. Um, I'm not really sure how accurate this is. This is mine and I have a cold and I've been home uh, for two days. So I had a lot of time to prepare the presentation, but I, my head, I am sorry, I am on cold medicine. So I am not necessarily all here. Um, but I tried, I was trying to figure out for people where the stressors are and when they happen. I mean, we've been talking a lot about Thompson because Thompson is the first one that's gonna hit, um, but you can see and I, I believe that closely on its heels in the next year, we have Audison and Hardy and Bishop that are also right mm -hmm. at the edge. Um, and um, I was trying to figure out, and you know, I need probably, Dr. Bodie should look at this and kind of see, um, you know, I kind of rolled in Audison classrooms. I don't know if there's like a huge need at one year to have like all 20 classrooms, but I kind of assumed that it would be a, a rolling in. So over three years, you kind of see them um, get up to that. Um, and, and that's what in a lot of the schools, right? You need a couple the first year, then you need a couple more, then you need a couple more. So just trying to, I would really like to better explain to people what is happening and where it's going on. Yeah. Um, when you did that, are you taking, like for Bishop where it needs zero to two, is that including like using the, repurposing classrooms which it's only like the classrooms that they listed on that sheet okay that so it's only classroom us. classroom it's not the specials you're not taking unless those. unless there was a special classroom listed as a potential use okay like the computer rooms yeah maybe. like okay. one room this computer room at bishop just the okay. computer room yeah okay but that's so i didn't i didn't i assumed no internal Re re okay. Rooms, right, okay. Right. Yeah. Thank so it was just from the list that Dr. Bodie gave us of available rooms. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's kind of where the tipping points happen when, I think. So, you know, as we get lower. Um, I also wanted to look at it another way. If you think about it, what we really need is we have these five elementary schools that are under a lot of stress um, for their enrollment, and what they all really need is to have 24 classrooms, right? They need four for six grades. Um, and so I just, mentally, you do the math, that's also 20 classrooms. So no matter how I look at it, it's 20 elementary classrooms. Thompson needs six, Bishop needs six, Hardy needs three, Dallin needs three, and Brackett needs two, at least, right? Um, there are also, there's other spaces that we need. Some of them are gonna need additional gym, lunch, after school space, special space, um, and again, we still have an additional 20 classrooms at the Audison that we need to do as well. So I just was trying to look at it from a couple of different ways to help people get their heads around, like, what, why is this happening? Um, and obviously, those are the five schools there. Uh, Pierce and Stratton are the two that are not. Um, I'm also trying to boil it down. I feel like for a lot of people on the enrollment task force, we're so stuck in the weeds we know this what's going on that it's hard for them to kind of so i wanted to try to say in my mind 
there's really only two educationally feasible ways that we do this. One, we add to the five elementary schools and we add to the Odyssey, mm -hmm. right? We do that. Or we can take the fifth graders out of the elementary schools, which alleviates the strain on the elementary schools, and we pair up five, six, and or you know some combination of five, six, and seven, eight. You know, and I'm not married to wh however to do that. You could make a five, six, seven, and then move the eighth to the high school. But you know, you can you can either relieve the strain from the elementary schools by removing a grade, um, and I think that there's probably more acceptance of doing that at a higher grade than doing it at a lower grade. I mean, you could take kindergarten out, but you know, I think that that's harder. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can so really, I think that. If, I can, if we can get it to a, a choice, a high level choice that we want to make, I think we need to have a high level vision of where we want it to go and then move back through what that means we need to do for all the short term you know, stress that we're seeing at places like Thompson and you know, in the next year in the Audison and the other places. So I'm trying to you know, think about, because I feel like there's so many possibilities out there that people can't even get their heads around. So I think if we can try to put them in these kind of bigger buckets first and make what I say is kind of a, a vision statement for the schools. And then once we've chosen the vision, we can choose then what the steps are to, to mm -hmm. mitigate it and, and move in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so if we remove the fifth grade from the elementary schools and do something like a five, six and a seven, eight, obviously one of those two can stay at Audison, um, and, but then we need to obviously build another school. So you're either kind of mucking with six schools or building a new school. Um, and I think that that wasn't clear to a lot of people. A lot of people saw that there were costs for Thompson and costs for this and costs for that. But I think that one thing that we really need to do is put it all together and try to give people different buckets of costs to choose from. Um, so a couple of timeline requirements. In order to build permanently anywhere by the 17-18 school year, we have to go to town meeting this January with the ask because we have to have the money and it takes that amount of time. Um, however, modulars can be in place with a year's notice. So we have a little bit more time if the solution for any of this is modulars, which for some short term might be anyway because um, it's harder to get to the long term. Um, and then this, I just put down all the dates that I knew so far that we were trying to work through. Um, we are right now on December 10. Uh, we have, you know, December 14th, the community relations meeting, uh, more facilities, uh, another school committee. Are we, did we finalize Dr. McKibben on the 18th? Yes. We did. So he's set. So he is coming on, uh, at 4.30 on the 18th of December. I assume it'll be at the high school. Yes. Um, to give us his new numbers, because as we know, uh, the numbers are short from what he gave us. Um, a lot of people are asking, and I feel like now that we've lived with those numbers for a while and people are throwing them back at us, I have a lot of questions. So I'm really excited that he's coming again. So we're going to get a new update on that. We can ask him all of our questions. Um, we know the 21st, hopefully, we hear about uh, whether or not the high school is. Um, and then the next meeting of the um, school enrollment task force is on the 22nd of December. Um, January, we have the parent forum a full school committee meeting, and then that town meeting is kind of where we're headed. That's, so that's the big strain right now on trying to deal with all this, um, is that we have to get to that with the right ask. We don't want to miss that, that time frame. So these are kind of the questions that we need to answer or that we need to be thinking about. We need to come up with complete solution costs and plans for people. They're asking us um, to start to try to put that together. We need decision timelines for whatever options we want to put out there. Um, we really, obviously, someone needs to refine my stress, you know, table because I'm not really sure I just did it. Um, and then tonight, I feel like what we really need is we need to have some high-level recommendations from the school committee on how we want to move this forward and what we can take back to the school enrollment task force. Um, they've been asking us a lot about pedagogy and about what we think is educationally sound um, and you know because you know like I said some of the ideas are crazy and that's okay because it makes you think about some other ideas um, but uh, I, I feel like the we really we haven't been able to talk about any of this so I haven't been able to talk about this we've had 
facilities mm -hmm. meetings where we've had some discussions, but until we have something that the mm -hmm. whole committee agrees that we want to move on, I, I don't want to take it to the school enrollment task force, because it should come from all of us, not just. So that is kind of all of my thinking and mm -hmm. trying to put it all kind of together and explain it. So I just wanted to make sure everybody had seen that. Um, I did not, at the school enrollment task force, uh, we did not talk about um, kind of this is my take on it, and I would ra I would like to have that discussion with you guys before I take it to the school enrollment task force mm -hmm. about like kind of. I feel like if we could just make some decision and head in some direction, you know, I feel like that's really hard, but, um, you know, I feel like that's what we need to do. I, it's hard too because, like I said, the McKibben numbers. The people on the numbers side of the table say to us, but in five years, the enrollment shrinks back down again. So why should we invest? And I'm like, no, no. But it, it shrinks back down to where we are now or a little bit higher. It's not like it's going to go away. Um, and a lot of people who have been coming to these meetings don't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm still not sure I believe it. Um, so that, that's one big question I have for Dr. McKibben is really after five years you see it really starting to retract and where are you getting that? Like, um, because uh, if we don't have, you know, we can't, we can't be for his numbers for the growth and not be for his numbers for the mm -hmm. shrink. Mm -hmm. So we either have to buy in or not buy in. Um, and so I'm tr having a hard time because they're having a hard time then saying, well, if it's temporary, mm -hmm. let's find temporary solutions and all kinds of crazy ideas. Let's, Minuteman's got a whole bunch of space. Let's bust into Minuteman. <laughs> that was Dr. <a> Allison. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm joke. serious. I mean, they're like looking for space everywhere, you know, and they're, they're kind of thinking about putting kids mm -hmm. everywhere. And, and I just, you know, I feel like we have to, we have to kind of get our hands around what mm -hmm. we think we really want to do and then, and then try to see if we can, can work that. Let's let your colleagues talk to you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you for sending this to us during the day so mm -hmm. after you did I went through it and spent time looking on the map of Arlington and you know where's there's lots mm -hmm. and what I'm wondering is the Pierce field the Pierce practice field doesn't look that different in size than the area that the Gibbs is on and I'm wondering could we create a high school slash upper middle school campus call it part of the high school, build a 7-8 classroom on the Pierce practice field. Maybe there can be some sharing of facilities, possibly gymnasium, mm -hmm. parking, things like that. Maybe get some reimbursement from MSBA for doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. We save the Gibbs and all their programs. And um, so we put 5-6 at, we do a 5-6 at Audison. We have seven, eight at the high school, and then they move on to the high, to the regular high school. Um, it would take the stress <coughs> off of all the elementary school. I mean, it, you would have to phase in, and there might be some years where you need to do a modulars or something, but um, it would take the stress off of all of the elementary schools. You could adjust what's remaining by redistricting. Um, it would offer the chance maybe to do some different educational stuff with our fifth graders. Like we could start a foreign language early, you know, a year earlier, or maybe we could do a um, sampler so that then when they go into sixth grade, they have knowledge and can pick their foreign language. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be by having them all together, we'd have efficiencies of scale and that the class sizes would be able to be more even Whereas if you do two separate middle schools, you're going to have more mm -hmm. inefficiency with teachers and it's going to be harder to keep, mm -hmm. you're either going to have to hire a lot more teachers or um, you're going to have, have, have different, differing class sizes. Um, anyway, it's, I just thought it had a lot of pluses mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, do we have any idea if it would sail with MSBA? I mean, as, as part of a, I mean, we told them already that we're interested in doing the eighth grade. grade and could we just throw in another grade and you know build a seven wrap it 12. all wrap it all together I think that's a question that can certainly be discussed mm -hmm. assuming where we are with them this year mm -hmm. yeah um, you would be putting another 
roughly 1,000 students, 900 to 1,000, uh, there is no parking to share. <laughs> right, and it, it's cheaper to build a garage. I build a garage. Build a garage, yeah. yeah. You have to do something, yeah. maybe underground. So, yeah. so this, and those kinds of things, MSBA would not fund. Right. Well, it, it, the funding a garage versus funding a school for 7th and 8th graders on our own, I'd rather fund the garage and maybe get the town to uh, mm -hmm. set up a parking authority and we could share it with people who need to park for other reasons in the mm -hmm. town. I mean, the, this, is, this is a fascinating little idea if we can get into play. Right. Now, the only problem, of course, is mm -hmm. the timing. Yeah. Because the high school is going to take a while. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if we could build on the Pierce Field earlier. I mean, there was a really good um, Al Hiltz, is that his name? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. Um, also drew up uh, basically adding, kind of making it a campus mm -hmm. and taking over the crusher lot, which is At the, the trees behind the Audison, um, which is a pretty good size of almost five acres of land there, mm -hmm. um, and kind of making it into a middle school campus. So build a 7-8 or a 5-6. And they're still on the same campus, but they're separate schools. Right. Mm -hmm. It's another place to build it. Um, it is wooded, and it's currently on the map as protected. I just don't know what level of protection that means mm -hmm. right now. But um, yeah, and that again, it saves the Gibbs. Um, if we can do that, I mean, again, this one is completely without the MSBA because it's on our own land. But um, it's also within our own timing, mm -hmm. right? If, if we can, if we can move on it, we can move on it and and do that. So, um, I mean, that is, I think, of all of the recommendations, that is my, I think, what I feel like if I envision what we need to do in order to help save these elementary schools, because I don't think that the pressure is going to go away very soon, and I don't think that enrollment is going to drop the way he thinks it is. Um, and so I'm worried that if we build on to the five elementary schools, that in another 10 years, we're gonna have to build on again. If we don't start thinking about how to do this differently um, and kind of alleviate some things. So I, I, I like the five, six, seven, eight idea. I just don't know where we necessarily put one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Seuss. Oh, so um, when that, that uh, plan has been mentioned in the past, there's always this question of, we just don't know if the high school, in the high school mm. um, proposal specifically, could support that many grades. Is there any way to do a study sooner? I mean, I know that certainly if we get to the feasibility stage, we have to study the space much more deeply and find out details like that. But would there be any way to answer that question? Because it's, if it's not feasible, well, we say, I mean, we still can leave potentially the Audison proposal up, but then we have to take it off the table. Right. But right. if it is feasible, then we have to seriously consider it, I think. Right, so right. it would be great to really to know that. Right, it'd yeah. be great to know, right, cost aside, and we're gonna have to pay for something, it'd be great to know, is that at all feasible given the physical space? Right. Um, is there any way to, to, that we could do that? I mean, is it? Um, I don't know how many acres it is. Right. Acreage would make it mm -hmm. be an important piece of it. Right now, Audison's acreage is about seven. You wouldn't, it's hard to believe that it's seven, but it's just the way it's configured. The high school is about 7.8. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about every buildable space or just the space you're talking about right now? The whole, I think the, I'd have to go back and look at the map, but I think it's, the, it's all of what the high school, the fields, everything. Okay. So on this, on uh, oh, 16, the high school is 7.74. Okay. The high school field. So I don't know what that means. I mean, I, 5, 3. I, I, so the, the, that's just mm -hmm. the footprint of the high school building no, part. So I don't know what that okay. means. I mean, I don't know. Well, it's that's the, the whole plot of this? land that the high school's on. Mm -hmm. I, I think as, for, for the town, it would be great to have this combined thing mm -hmm. because I think we could get some benefits. Um, certainly, we could do things like introduce athletics into the middle school easier because right. there'd be yeah. fields and stuff yeah. nearby. Exactly. Yeah. Um, they could share some of the resources. Um, auditorium space could be shared or something, you know. Right. Uh, but 
if it's not feasible, it's not feasible. So that's why it'd be just great right. to know, is it a genuine possibility? Well, that's not. that's why you have a feasibility study with MSBA. So that's exactly. We can't do that until we, we can't, know the feasibility. We wouldn't be able to know that in the next couple of weeks at all. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly that, or maybe the next couple of months before the town meeting vote. The, the real time, the regular town meeting. Spring. Right. Well, the question is that if the state goes and says, yeah, you're, you're going to the next level, mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what kind of conversations can we have with them? Right, right. For, or, the, or with architects. Yeah. I mean, frankly, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. different question about whether they're going to pay for it, but then there's this basic question, is it all possible? Right. Is there room so, is there, on yeah. the lot? Well, yeah. the, thing, the thing is, we have put an SOI in f to the high school. Mm -hmm. In that SOI, we identified the enrollment issues at Audison. And one of the things we put in was the possibility of the eighth grade um, perhaps being combined so in some way with the high school. We did not put in anything about a seventh, eighth grade separate <coughs> school. Right. That so, would be in the same campus. But that's not, that's not, I mean, that's the question about who's going to pay for it. But the question, I think, is, is it physically possible? <laughs> is it physically and possible? If, again, if the answer is no, then we don't think about it anymore. Well, that, that's a question that we would probably have to hire an architect right. To, right. to take a look at. Um, it might even be possible to have one of the members of the task force who is an architect um, mm -hmm. to take a look at that as well. Right. So, yeah. to, just to the broad question, is it possible? Right. No, I mean, uh, I, yeah. yeah, and there, there will be a lot of issues with the seventh grade in that field, um, a, a, another building in that field because of access. Mm -hmm. Drop so, offs. Mm -hmm. so I, I think we just need to know this. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think we can't, I think sort of speculating yeah. I, I think that not, we can take a look at that. We um, can certainly take a look at that. Uh, there's probably more of a chance that if it was uh, had some adjacency to the high school, that that might be a conversation you could have right. with MSBA. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I I can't even predict mm -hmm. what they would say. Clearly, if you went to a field that was not adjacent, um, it would be a separate yeah. project altogether. Yeah. Where's your? Uh, so in the in the uh, feasibility well, study, we have what's. Nine months to do a feasibility study. Is it we have to go through the the first phase of it, which you can shorten up. It's a, about a nine month phase. Uh, nine days. months. Well, it's remember we had to do a yeah. lot of different things to prepare in terms of committee okay. and and getting the the money for the feasibility study. So there's a lot of um, conversations <clears throat> and administrative pieces. But then you get the money for the feasibility study, and that's when you start really looking at. What is the oh, what is the there, preferred? Yeah. Is that you? And we could get me. that in January. No, so we then get we just have to vote for that displays. money in January. Mm -hmm. We have to wait till April. If we were approved this. Well, year. the warrant article for January is broad enough that the answer could be yes. Okay, good. The feasibility study oh, we uh, that we would do in the MSBA process, we have the flexibility if we want, right? It's our money that we're spending on the feasibility study to look at the needs at seven, eight. Nine, nine through twelve, we could do that. So we're not. I, I think you could look at that whether that would, they would agree with it. Um, I, I don't know. And another piece of this too is that, what, one of the things that MSBA does is they sort of have broad estimates as to what a project will be. So, they have a certain amount of money, and I think for this particular cycle, they had about five hundred and forty million dollars. Yeah. So. They're, they, not that they have an exact dollar amount, but they're doing approximations in terms of the cost of a project. So they are inviting people into the grant process based on rough ideas of what, and so that's another factor that, I, again, I can't even be, predict what they would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna have to spend town money on something anyway. So right. then, right. you know, the question is, what do we? Well, spend and that's on the, I think that that's um, that's really key is trying to come up with, you know, if we add the five schools and the Audison, is that the same as building a new building? And if not, well, that's what one decision point, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's the same, then it's still like that's what I think that's the hard part is there's so many decisions that mm -hmm. it's become such a a snowball, you know. Um, 
How much well, would it cost to add a performing arts center or an arts center to the high school if we were funding that as the town? That's and we question. took the uh, took Gibbs. the Gibbs. Right. I mean, you know, right. Right. It, there's so many moving parts because I think that there's such a commitment on this committee to do the right thing, not only for the kids but for the rest of the community. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, I just have one one. It's, it's difficult, Mr. Thielman. Thanks. As I, if, as I understand it, our, our decision uh, in January is, is really that what, what, the, what the task force was asking us last night was whether or not we're going to make a proposal regarding the Thompson. So that is something we have to zero in on as a committee. That's what, right. they, that's what they want to know. Are you right. going to? And gonna I think that decision is are we going to add on permanently mm -hmm. or are we would we rather build a, a different school? Well, because right. if we're going to add on to Thompson, at that point, I think you may as well add on to all of them. Right. So, well, yeah. That's another tipping point. Right? That's and, another thing that we have to decide. And and you can also slow the decision down too. Um, while that, while we could make that decision, clearly Thompson needs classrooms. But you can do temporary least modulars for a period of time right mm -hmm. and that's yeah, if we're be, heading in one direction then we can kind of mm -hmm. you know you can have more time on more time on the decision right that that's possible and if that's what people decide I think I think for all of us one of the linchpins in all of this in the decision models is what's going to happen with the high school mm -hmm. right and once we know that that really is going to make some big differences mm -hmm. in what we can yeah, do yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the one other thing that I want to say is that when we said that the Odyssey is the seventh largest middle school in the state. Last year. I don't know what it is last this year. Last year. We don't have the numbers for this year. But last year, the largest was in Marlboro, and they had 1325. Mm. And they've got a declining enrollment. So it's not going to take much for us to get from seventh largest <laughs> to largest. Right. And if the largest now is around 1300, 1,500 is it beyond uh, uh, contemplation uh, to, yeah. to think about having 1,500 Middle adolescents schoolers. in one building uh, just on itself. I don't care, with a big site with lots of cafeterias and gyms and stuff <coughs> is one thing, but to pack them into, into that site even with added classrooms, uh, no. <coughs> right, no. Yeah. which is why I think, you know, you can, uh, if you if you looked at the um, so an architect drew up an idea which mm -hmm. is that you build kind mm -hmm. of another building and then walkways up mm -hmm. to it from the Audison that we have to mm -hmm. up to the crusher lot which is literally mm -hmm. right behind Audison mm -hmm. right behind you know where yeah. the parking mm -hmm. lot is um, mm -hmm. is another idea because mm -hmm. it breaks it up but keeps it together mm -hmm. like like having a 7-8 on the high school campus mm -hmm. right now you have the campus and he even went as far as to like, you know, there's a street that runs up there and that could lead right to a new parking lot and a new, you know, facility. And so, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting idea, you know. Um, or you can add permanent modulars onto the middle school. Mm -hmm. You can have a base of six classrooms and go up three, three levels. Mm -hmm. Right. You could get 18. Well, I'm not sure 18 will do it even at its, when it, if you get to maximum capacity. And you'd be overtaxing the rest of the, right. the building. Right, you still need more gyms. Yeah, that, that, that building right, was right. built for 900 kids. Right, yeah, it, it would be totally overtaxing. Is, Dr. Allison Ampey. Can I show you this since we spent all the time? I, I think, that, I'd love to see this. Okay, so these are screenshots from Google Maps. They're both at the same resolution. Um, so this one, this map is by the high school, and I'm at an angle, so it's kind of hard to do this. So this is the Pierce practice field here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's DPW, the DPW parking lot there. And there's the high school over here. This side is the Gibbs and the Gibbs parking lot. And I'm just, you know, visually, they're not yeah. that different. So it just, you know, from a very high level view, it looks. Right, well, they are, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, the Gibbs is not on is it on? I don't think it's on this map that Adam gave us. Oh, it's not. Okay. Um, I, does anyone have any questions or can I plug uh, 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 No, no um, but I, I just got to say I'm intrigued by your idea. Right. 
No, and I think that's, that's, I mean, I think that, you know, if we don't end up adding on to five elementary schools in the Audison, we have to build somewhere. And the, then the question is where? Do we build on the Gibbs? Do we build on Crusher? Do we build on Pierce Field? Do we build in the middle of Monotomy Rocks Park? Do we build, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, you know, we there's were trying to build in the cemetery. At, uh, to build few, in the cemetery. A few holes over at the <laughs> Winchester Country Club. Right, uh, right, right. The, so the, the challenge, we don't have a lot of empty land. Right. And the large parcels that there are around, like Mirex, uh, car dealership, uh, I think that they're quite attached to. So uh, um, land acquisition costs, if we wanted to go after something, would be very high, too. And that just, we're done. Yeah. You know, one, one point to, to consider was that uh, Kathy passed out this memo, which everyone, I think everyone got, which was renovating the Gibbs for a school is 14 to $20 million. And when you do that 14 to $20 million renovation, you get a school that can house eight grades, sixth graders, fifth graders, whatever we decide to do, whatever we uh, conclude is best educationally. Um, but then you displace all those tenants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you've spent 14 to $20 million building a facility for our students. You've displaced these tenants. And if we want to help them as a community, we got to help, we, we either got to help them find a home outside of Arlington or help them find a home inside of Arlington. And if it's inside of Arlington, uh, that could cost us some money too, especially with the Arlington Center for the Arts. So it's not, mm -hmm. it may not be the best financial solution. Right. Yeah, yeah there are a lot of moving oh, parts here. So, 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 uh, so, so let, 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 let me, okay, to. that's what I was gonna okay. get to you. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Starks, so, let's, let's put forth the questions we need okay, to answer. So I think that one of the big questions that we can answer is how big do we really think we want the middle school to be? I mean, you know, we heard from, uh, you know, the middle school principal, even he is kind of, you know, hesitant that it get much larger. Um, but, you know, in our vision, do we want it to get much bigger or would we rather have you know, and I, I like the way you said, you know, if you break it up, if, I mean, because the other possibility is you take 500 middle school students, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what that is, maybe it's mm -hmm. one cluster of each and you move them over to the Gibbs, but like you said, who gets to go, who gets yeah. to stay, right? That gets really hard. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather have a small middle school, as hard as that might be, than put one grade somewhere. Mm -hmm. I just don't feel like putting one grade somewhere is a good idea. I don't know why, I but I just... I don't feel like that's a great idea. Well, let me just say that I think that that's, that bears a lot of discussion and thought and reflection. So I, can't, I don't know if we can just make a kind of a visceral, right. I don't want one grade in one place. I just don't think that's a good way to make a decision. Yeah. We have, Needham I'm not has making had, a decision. Yeah. I'm putting out there what I think. Needham has had a lot of success with the sixth grade, and I know some people that have worked in that district, and they like it. Um, you know, the, um, would they like to have grades together? They probably might, but they seem to like the sixth grade there in Needham and it seems to have good results. Mm -hmm. The principal of the middle school tonight talked about some value to the sixth grade. So I'm not, I'm not wedded to one idea or another. Mm -hmm. I want to study it more, and I think it's a, it's the re I want to see a lot of research and reflection on that point. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I talk to parents, mm -hmm. um, they are generally against the idea of putting a single grade for a very reflective reason. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea educationally. But I think if it is a good idea educationally, we need to hear from teachers, we need to hear from educators, we need to sort of have a conversation with the community about why that's a good idea, mm -hmm. if it is. Because what I'm hearing from parents is they don't like it. Just instinctively, reflectively, they hate it. <laughs> so I think if we were building a school district from scratch with these numbers, we probably would create two middle schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think that given where we are now, I understand that that might be a more difficult thing to pry apart a middle school and mm -hmm. create two schools. Um, so I think for those, uh, if we take over the Gibbs, if we decide to um, do that to alleviate the overcrowding at Audison or somewhere else, I guess, um, I just want to have a conversation with educators and find out more what their thoughts, and at all levels, not just the sixth graders, but I want to hear from elementary school educators and everything just to to sort of have a conversation about the benefits and disadvantages of doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, can I, I want to make one more point if I may. Um, one of the things I've heard a few times is this worry that if we take the fifth grade out of the elementary school, mm -hmm. that we're going to result in some schools being too empty as the population declines. And I think the population will eventually 
level off. I mean, you know, I have a lot of friends right now who are living in East Arlington who no longer have kids in the elementary school, right? And we're not moving. So the, that sort of happens where people have kids, they pass through one school, and then they move on. Um, but I think it's important to realize that right now we're not dealing with an ideal situation mm -hmm. in terms of the facilities that mm -hmm. we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't realize that the 11 extra classrooms that we have this year, those aren't really empty, right? right. <laughs> I mean, so that there aren't computer labs in schools. There aren't, I mean, maybe there shouldn't be, but there aren't, right? There aren't after school programs, um, dedicated schools, uh, rooms for after school programs. Um, there aren't, you know, wiggle rooms or, you know, other things that, that, that people want, right? So I'm not that worried about the idea of a, of a school having three sort of extra classrooms, right? <laughs> you know, if we take out fifth grade. I think, I, and, and population declines a little, I think we could probably do something with those classrooms that would be really good educationally. So, uh, you know, I, I know that we have to worry about cost, and I think that's a really big consideration, and I don't want to build unnecessarily, right? I don't want to overbuild. To your point, but, to your point, yes. the Dallin opened in 2006 with 348 students. Yep. Uh, last year it had 456. Yep. Hardy, when it was renovated in 2001, opened with 270. Yep. It, now, it had 392 in 2014. Mm -hmm. Bishop, when renovated and reopened in 2000, had 371. 2014, they had 415. Brackett opened in 1999 with 263 students. In 2014, they had 497. When Stratton, uh, in, uh, Stratton was last renovated in 1963, but they had 306 students in 2006. They now have 408. Pierce opened in 2003 with 228. They now have 267. And Thompson opened in 2013 with 358. One year later, 392. Okay? Um, right, right. So right, we're, we're stressed now. We're, yeah. we're not we're at a we're stress. Not have, yeah. You know, we don't have much just are hanging around right now. Right, right. So, so the idea that maybe some schools will be a slightly better situation than they are now is not talking about a bunch of empty classrooms sitting there right, doing nothing. Right. Maybe we can get them back to where they were designed to be. Right, 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 right exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you're trying to get a sense of the committee so you can go yes. back. So yes. I'm going to ask you to push on the committee. Uh, uh, let's go quickly around on the size of the middle school. And I will say I don't want 1,500 uh, adolescents in one school. Uh, middle school size, Dr. Allison Ampey. I don't think it should be bigger. Um, I don't think it should be bigger than it is now. I don't think there's enough. The core doesn't support it. And there's just not a way of enlarging it. So, no, we, we need to find some other solution. Uh, Mr. Seelman. So, I would, you know, in, I, want a, I want a smaller middle school. Uh, you know, I think that goes without saying. Uh, what that actually means, I would want to see a plan that talked about um, ratios of administrators, counselors, social workers support staff, nurses, to students in any configuration. So whether it's a 5-6, a 6-7, whether it's just sixth grade by themselves, I think these questions need to be answered. Uh, so theory, yeah, general, high level, answer, smaller school, absolutely. But I think it's about really looking at it in a much more granular way than we have. Yeah. That's, why I, that's why I raised that question before. You know, I, I need to know how many adults there are going to, to be to support each of the kids in the, in the school. I mean, mm -hmm. how many social workers, how many counselors, how many nurses, mm -hmm. how many case work, how many uh, teachers, mm -hmm. how easy is it going to be to offer different services, uh, different language services. I mean, that's a, so there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into it. And if we come out with that, you know what, we can't, we can actually offer more services to kids and more support in a bigger school, I got to be open to changing my mind. Mm -hmm. when that data comes here. I can't be kind of wedded to one right, position. Right, right. Because sometimes Seuss. size gives I, you... I'm just trying to uh, yeah. do a so, lightning round so we're not here a little bit. Dr. That. Seuss. So I think if you designed a school from scratch for 1,400 kids, it might be, there might be things that you can get out of that. I think that that particular school, you cannot add that many students with the common spaces and the way it's structured so that you can't separate out grades and stuff. 
I think that to create something that we'd want to have would require so much money that it, we just can't do it. Mr. Pierce. I don't think Mr. Pierce. Uh, You're collecting information. You go last. I like the idea of students not changing schools a lot. I don't much get the towns that have four or five school changes in a kid's K through 12 life. I think that there is a reason. Now, look, I'm not an educator. I'm a lawyer, so I don't know the uh, pedagogy or whatever you're looking to find out. But uh, I do know that there are liability issues when I see the students rushing in the Audison Middle School after a class a bell rings, and it's like a herd. It is a herd, and it's galloping. And if there are any extra students in that hallway, I can't imagine what it would look like. So part of me thinks that elementary should be K through five and the kids' experience should be that. And secondary should be six through 12. And there should be two schools. I mean, I don't know how realistic that would be, um, but the student would only have to change once. Um, that's just a fantasy, I guess. But as to the middle school and its size, it should be smaller than it is now. And ideally, it should be with, um, with two grades, not three. Uh, Ms. Starks, to summarize. So, well, I teach in a middle school of 824 students, um, which at times seems really big and sometimes seems really small. Um, but we also are growing, and my school will undergo renovations to add a three-story addition on next year. Um, so we are headed towards getting bigger. Um, I have a feeling they're about to build it for 9 to 950. Um, so I know it's possible, but I feel like definitely 1,100 just seems like, I don't know, there's something about when you cross that 1,000 line, that's like mm -hmm. the size of a high school, mm -hmm. like that just, I don't know what that is, but I just feel like as a teacher, I like knowing that I know, you know, a third of the sixth graders right now, um, and that, you know, every kid in that school has someone who knows them well, which is the whole idea behind middle school. Um, and I just don't think you get to certain numbers and that just doesn't, it isn't true anymore. It's really hard for the administrators to know them all. Mm -hmm. And it's important that they know them all too. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, I know my kids, but I certainly don't know all the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like the ideal size is somewhere in that eight to 900, mm -hmm. you know, give or take a little bit um, of, of a high school. I really like the idea of doing a five, six, seven, eight I even like doing it as a campus in the same place, so it's not even really a transition. I yeah. mean, it's a different building, but it's a you know same, a similar same. place. So if it's seven eight on the high school or seven eight on the Audison, um, you know, having it be in one place because they are similar age and and they have similar needs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I too, if we were to add it at the Audison, I do want to make sure that we have all of the facilities and all of the things that they need. You know, we're going to need two of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it is an additional school, but I also, you know, can see that being, you know, I, I like it being with another school, mm -hmm. you know, so it, whether it's at the high school or on the Pierce Field or at the Audison, I much prefer that than putting them out at the Gibbs. Um, I guess because I still like having them together. It, it makes mm -hmm. it more makes of a, sense. you know, campus mm -hmm. feel. A, a, you know, mm -hmm. um, so that's you know, one thing that's the next, out of this. The next question you need is because it's nine forty-five, and I know yeah. that we're going to be moving the ten o'clock rule. Okay. So um, the next question you needed answered was in terms of the elementary schools. Neighborhood schools. <clears throat> Neighborhood schools. Neighborhood schools. That's the task force wants our thoughts on that. Yeah. So let's go and do the lightning round again on neighborhood schools. Dr. Allison Ampey. I think that Arlington Fields are very important. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say that again? I think Arlington Fields, they're very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, I really, I don't, I, I mean, I think that literally hundreds, maybe thousands of families moved to the town with that promise. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the culture of the town. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have to explore, you know, one of the things we, we figured out years ago on the school committee and then we haven't really addressed it in a long time, but was that, you know, one of the realities of the neighborhood schools with that is that there were inevitably unequal class sizes across the district. Mm -hmm. That was just sort of what we had to accept. And so I think that's, but that's, I've always been comfortable with that. Mm 
And the other thing, as I wanted to say, I was going to make I never knew the name of that lot was the Crusher lot until yeah, this whole thing. Crusher lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this has been a great education. It's just a piece so of it's like a place done. where you take the old cars. I know, exactly. I guess so. uh, I don't, I don't, it must be somebody's name. Um, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't have anything much to add. I, I think that the town is committed to it. I have many, many pleasurable, fond memories of walking my daughter to school and enjoyed that and would not have been as fun if I had to drive her someplace, but, um, but okay, I don't know, maybe I'll yeah. What? I, I think the town is very much committed to that. I think getting rid of that, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to achieve that much, frankly. Yeah. Any, We're not going to get that much out of it. Yeah. Any possible savings in efficiency would uh, be uh, at the expense of huge cost and angst over the uh, neighborhood schools. I think that it would, it's, it's a no starter. Right. Uh, Mr. Pierce. Uh, Pierce. Yeah, I think buffer zones were for us the third rail in that, you know, it, it, it started to fray that idea a little bit. And that's why we got a lot of uh, outcry and, and, and it was very valid because as a parent, two small kids, I, I share the same memories that Dr. Seuss has mm -hmm. and all of us have of, um, you know, knowing the crossing guard and, uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and frankly, I mean, I think that the Thompson Hardy area is a neighborhood in and of itself. I agree with that. I think that the two share two schools share um, similarity in, in size and, and, and geography. We are a small town anyway. Um, it's nice to think that the students all play together in town leagues and they get to know each other eventually when they're middle school students. Um, but uh, there is something nice about um, the, the neighborhood streets and, and, and joining up at the neighborhood schools field. Um, so I wouldn't want to disturb that. Ms. Uh, Starks. Um, I never got the chance to walk my kids to school. I live in the Bishop Bussing yeah. District, so I put my kids on the bus. Um, <laughs> but I did walk them to the bus stop. Um, it is different, um, and it's interesting because I've, we've just been finishing up the Thompson video, and one of the things the parents said was, you know, there was a lot of angst around busing those kids off in three different directions at first. And they, you know, and then it's funny because then the, it goes on and it says, yeah, you know what? They were much better at it than we were. It turns out it wasn't a big deal, you mm -hmm. know? And it was funny. I mean, you know, it's true. I mean, I think, but I, I do agree that I think the neighborhood schools are something that define Arlington. Mm -hmm. It's one of those small town things mm -hmm. that people like about this town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I think that they like that it's a town. They like that yeah. we have these small schools and yet they're more expensive, and it's a different way of running things, but that seems to be what people like. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would tend to agree on that. Anything else on your question list that we need to bring back? Uh, we have to talk about the Thompson, I think, right? Because that's sort of the immediate. Oh, is there a uh, class size question you want to? Class size. <laughs> well, you oh, well although, there were four questions, yeah, yeah, right. which is town needs. That's the Gibbs conversation. That's the Gibbs conversation. Then, it's kind of where we weigh on that. And so I think we need to hear what people say about that. Before. Yeah. And I think the other one is class size, it's just to, which is kind of theoretical, but we should at least see what people think before right. we go back to the committee. You know. Right. I I mean, I, I, okay, class size, I think we're at the squeal point. We can't get any bigger. Um, right. Well, like I said, I'm trying to work on a formula that talks about teacher load um, mm -hmm. and trying to define what we think is an acceptable teacher mm -hmm. load, and that would take into account, um, you know, it would have multipliers for age, and, you know, it's very different for an elementary school teacher who teaches all four subjects, mm -hmm. right? So they have four subjects, but only 24 mm -hmm. kids, but they also have really little kids, mm -hmm. um, and then you have to add in the special needs and ELL, mm -hmm. and are they high, you know, whatever. Um, so I'm trying really hard to kind of come up with something, but I feel like that there is, I mean, there's just a certain amount of size too, mm -hmm. right? I mean, our classrooms can't hold, mm -hmm. you know, 40 kids. Mm -hmm. um, but I also realize that, you know, if I had a class of 30, if I had help in that class, I could do that. Um, so that's the other thing that I struggle with is that, you know, yeah, I think that there should be some limits, but all I feel like is there should be a limit and then if you go above that, here are the steps that we're going to take to mitigate it at every level. And if it ever reaches here, that's a new classroom. Like it can't, you know, and that's what I would like to try to get my head around and see if people have 
numbers that they associate with those. Well, I, I, I don't think we're going to get to that decision tonight. No, but, no. but is it, I, I do so, want to... Because it's at 9.51 oh, now. So <laughs> what, is there anything else you need to know tonight from this committee Gibbs. in order to Gibbs. move forward? Go ahead, Gibbs. 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 Uh, uh, so ask the question specifically and we'll go around do another lightning round. No, I need the answer. Okay, uh, doc, Dr. Allison Ampey. You need to be paying attention to what the design constraints were for the classes that were already built because yes. that's a hard limit mm -hmm. and there's different sizes and, and some of them are smaller than you would think. So that's right. just, mm -hmm. you can't just assume you can go to 30 mm -hmm. in every. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. All right, um, I think that the ask on the Gibbs is I don't know what the ask on the Gibbs is. Well, what do, we what do you mean? think the ask on the Gibbs is? I think okay, that, everybody gets a comment on the Gibbs. I, I Mr. Think, Thielman. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see if, I, I think if we were, right now, based on what I know right now, okay, if we were to take that building over, we'd have to put somewhere between 14 and $20 million of improvements into that building. We would displace tenants who are serving the town. And we, I feel an obligation as a, member of town meeting as a parent as if somebody uses a lot of the facility or use my kids used uh, programming there um, to uh, to try to help those tenants find other space which is going to cost the town money as well so for me I, I just don't see it as a viable option uh, we were asked last night mm -hmm. to see if we could use some classrooms in that building for a temporary period of time I don't think I don't think that's possible but Dr. Bodie has to kind of do some research on that um, so that's where I'm at right Dr. Allison Ampey I would much prefer not to have to use it. I would, I, I want to hear what our other options are though before I totally roll it out. I, I agree either way we're going to be paying more costs, but I just, I want to know what the options are before I say no totally. But I'm, I like, I like the Pierce practice field better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Seuss. Well, I am at the Gibbs almost every day. In fact, my son was uh, opening night of a play there tonight. Um, <laughs> one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Um, Wait, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really, it's a tough, tough play. Um, it's a much beloved place for me. I, what I have been saying to people all along is there's a lot of passion around the arts, rightly so. This town is committed to the arts and it should be. Um, it, it is possible to potentially find another place for the arts. And it's potentially easier, well, it's hard, they're hard, everything's hard, to find another place for the arts than to find a new school building. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't help the other tenants of Gibbs, who are also incredibly valuable members of our community, but who we're just hearing less about from, right? I mean, that's, you know, what I hear from mostly is the arts community, and then my response is, I think this town is committed to arts, and I think they, because of that commitment, they will put up money to find a place for the arts if needed. Um, because the town is so committed, but it doesn't solve the other problems. I mean, there, we have this adult daycare program that I haven't heard people talk about. There's just sort of less excited people about it, but it also serves our community. It's an incredibly valuable program. Mm -hmm. And then we have preschool program, and, and you know, we have a bunch of things there. So it's a difficult thing. Um, Mr. Pierce. <laughs> Well, it's hard to follow that because she was just talking about a show with kids in it and asking if I want to disrupt that, make it a school. Um, <laughs> no, I really don't. And, and I, I don't think it's viable because it's older. It would cost a lot of money, as Mr. Thielman suggests. And I love the idea of having, you know, some type of campus arrangement, whether it's for, for younger kids or, or high school age kids. When we were in town hall, I said, you know, what is the viability of just building a new building, you know? Right. And, and that's frankly where I stand on this. You know, I'd like to see, instead of big apartments and condos going up in Arlington, I'd like to see viable performing arts spaces or viable schools going up, because those are the things that we really need as a town here, you know? So that's where, that's where I stand. I, I really want that to be a, a, a school of last resort for us. Right. I, I look at it as being all tied to the high school thing, and mm -hmm. I, I'm looking. I, I want to see the possibilities of doing a performing arts center at the high school, because we have such a great theater department, such a great music department, and such awful space for them. Uh, we've got to do that better, and we can probably come up with some sort of arrangement, like Barnstable or Chelmsford has done, 
to, to have a performing arts component. And for doing that, uh, to add town money into the high school project to build an arts center in there uh, as well to, to meet that need that, that would be shared space between the high school and the integrate programs. Uh, and if we did that, you know, okay, we'd move ACA over in, into the art center, the town art center attached to the high school, and we'd be able to use Gibbs as a school without all the disrupt, without all of the disruption that we'd have. I mean, the thing is, is that everybody went into the Gibbs knowing that it's a school in reserve, and we were renting it below market rates because it was a school in reserve, and there might come a time where we'd need it, and that time is there. I mean, that's a reality. So that, you know, it, it to me comes back to what is the town willing to pay for? Are they willing to pay for a premium on a school project in order to keep the services and amenities in the Gibbs or to provide them a new home somewhere else in the town? I think the town would want to do that. I think it's that kind of town. How we do it, I don't know. So I'm not really locked into any one solution. But I must say that uh, Dr. Allison Ampey's uh, uh, thoughts of uh, building 7-8 on the high school site and seeing if we can wrap it into the SBA gets us a little more reimbursement of money and might be the most cost-effective, wonderful thing we could do. Mm. So I think it's important just when we talk at the next meeting that you know the committee hasn't really reached a decision mm -hmm. yeah, about right. Gibbs. Yeah. So I think we need to be clear about that. No, mm -hmm. no vote, no decision. Yep. Right. Right, right. But you've got a sense of the, the, yeah, but, the wide yeah. sense. But on the neighborhood right. schools, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. we're all in on there was that. Pretty, there was a lot of clarity. Yeah. Right. That, right. That, that's clear. And I think it's fairly clear that we all think the middle school is too it's big too large. in the way it is, mm -hmm. and we'd like to see it's it small. Too large right. as it is, yeah. OK. It is 9.59. I'm looking for a motion. So uh, to do what? To extend the time for which we have to... Uh, to, to move the 10, 10 o'clock <laughs> rule <laughs> until... Until 1030. 10.30. Motion by Dr. Seuss, second. second by Mr. Pierce. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's, that's unanimous. Um, so, uh, facilities, are we now done with... Mr. Chairman? Uh, yeah. Mr. Dr. Allison Ampey. Can I bring up one other thing because we've talked about it and I don't Why want not? parents to freak out. Um, just that, can we hear from the administration about the, what is it like if we move the fifth grade students to, you know, a five, six school or to the Audison um, and just educationally is it sound, socially, social and emotionally is it sound? Because mm -hmm. I know it's something that some parents are going, I, I think parents feel less strongly about it because we didn't have an uproar about having the Stratton fifth graders at the, high, the middle school. Middle Fourth school. graders, yes, but right, fifth right. graders, no, they were, they were cool with it. Um, and I'm not saying that everyone will feel that way, but just mm -hmm. that we need to be acknowledged. This is something that's going to bother some people and we should know at least what our thinking is and whether we feel it's worth the trade-off. Mm -hmm. So, that's right. Uh, district uh, count. Oh, okay. There's, there's, there's one last thing, which yeah. is we need input on this because we uh, are being asked to make a recommendation on the Thompson. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, we're going to meet next week. We can talk about it some more. Mm -hmm. But we've got to, you know, I don't know. I mean, Kathy, that this, we got to make, they're asking us for some recommendation on the Thompson task force is for the January town meeting? Well, the recommendation doesn't need to be made the next meeting. There is time in early January. Um, but this I mean, it's possible we, we may not know the answer to the high school when we meet on the 22nd. It's possible. It is, but I think this committee, we need to know what we need to be thinking about as a committee so we can have a conversation about it. Maybe it's too late tonight. If you, well, given what you've been just talking about, if you decide that you want to hold out and take a look at that possibility of, of a 7-8, for that matter, 5-6, um, then you do not want to build permanently onto Thompson. Yeah. Right. But you do want to have modulars to relieve the stress, and it would make sense, particularly in this case, to do the modulars next year. 
However, the, it's more and complicated than that. It's, it's, you're talking. I'd like to see the numbers of how much it would cost to build permanently to well, install. Yeah. I, yeah. I sent it to right. you. Okay. Yeah. It's in there. Uh, it's in, it's in this report. Oh, okay. And, and I put some caveats on this. This is just industry numbers. This isn't, mm -hmm. it's really just a magnitude of comparison. They could be off somewhat, mm -hmm. their estimates at this point. But in rough numbers, permanent modulars cost twice as much as temporary. Uh, maybe not quite as much, because there is a, a rental fee with them every month. They, yeah, it depends on how much, but See, there is. The installation is the installation's always the issue with modulars. And the other piece that's different is the, the planning time to get permanent is roughly twice as long. Okay. Uh, we can take that up again next time. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think next week we need to, next when, Thursday night, we need to have time on the agenda to just talk about this question because they're asking us, what do you want to do? Yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, one thing to add, I, I know that the Thompson community is having some sort of gathering mm -hmm. of parents to talk about um, issues, mm -hmm. and I'd love to hear from them, specifically about common core spaces. So that's a big worry, I think. Common core? Um, common spaces. Common, I'm sorry, common, common spaces. spaces. Common spaces. Right, right. They're doing the common core all over sorry, the place. Sorry. <laughs> common spaces is a big worry. Yeah. And so I know one suggestion is to take one of those classrooms and use it as an auxiliary gym. Because mm -hmm. that's maybe, you know, gym is just too small to, and you can't double up gyms. I mean, they, one, in one case, this is just one example, they doubled up the gym and they couldn't do anything and they did a rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> that is just not a good thing to do, right? I mean, we need kids to move around and run around. So, um, so we need more gym space. So I'd love to hear from the community um, some suggestions about common space issues, and I don't want to overlook those issues. I think that if we build classrooms and we ignore the need to potentially expand the common spaces, we're going to be kicking ourselves. So we want to sort of have a clear idea of what our future needs are in that direction. Okay. District Accountability Curriculum Instruction Assessment, Mr. Thielman. We met this evening at 5.30 p.m. Uh, and we talked about different pieces of information we should have for the four categories of the superintendent evaluation. I don't know where those notes are, but it, I mean, basically, uh, we're going to meet again in January. We're going to ask for time on the agenda of the school committee in February, and we're going to come before you with um, recommendations on evidence that the superintendent should, should start preparing now on the four standards, instructional leadership, management and operations, family community engagement, professional culture, as well as uh, two goals that we chose, uh, closing the achievement gap and then developing a space plan, and then uh, a, 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 a practice goal for the superintendent and a other goal. Uh, student, yeah. achievement. Student, student achievement. Student achievement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. we'll, we'll, we'll have something for you and uh, we're February. working on it, and we'll have a good process After for the evaluation. Okay, on. community <laughs> relations. Uh, so our next meeting is on 12-14, um, where we're going to talk about the, our January visioning meeting, and that I have a mm -hmm. question for the committee. Um, new information last night, um, the task force agreed to co-sponsor the uh, January visioning meeting, which is January 7th. Um, we want to know if this should be a community relations meeting or it should be a school committee. I mean, shouldn't it be, should it, should, I, I, should I want to take a vote on whether we should be an official school committee meeting co-sponsored by the enrollment task force. And, and actually, frankly, mm -hmm. potentially there might be other co-sponsors, but this is where we stand right now. Should it, so. we be a sponsor of the event or yeah. should it be our meeting? Um, I think you're asking for us yeah. to be a co-sponsor of the event. We are a, oh, the sponsor of the event, I guess. Yeah. So, so right now, I mean, it's sort of coming out of the community relations mm -hmm. subcommittee. Do we not want to do that and just say this is a school committee, school committee <laughs> function fun mm -hmm. meeting mm -hmm. that is then co-sponsored by the enrollment task force? Okay. Uh, that's, so that's the motion on the table. Is that specific enough? Or well, you know, I just one thought. Yeah. Mm. So I think this particular meeting, since it's about school visioning, should be chaired by someone from the school committee. Just, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So either mm -hmm. you or the chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not a co-sponsor. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, no, I don't yeah. want to sponsor. That's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. It should be a school committee. Mm -hmm. So I was, really, the question is, right now, it's is it a, a subcommittee? Is it a subcommittee sort of sponsored thing, or is it a school committee sponsored thing? Um, 
I think it sounds better. And, and by the way, I, I think that we should all be involved in this. So we're going to talk details on Monday, um, who specifically should do what, and we're all going to go to you for asks pretty mm -hmm. soon <laughs> to get involved, <laughs> just as a warning. <laughs> because we really have to come out of that. We have to come out of that with, with the answer to those four questions, mm -hmm. but not just well, we but not just a pie in the sky. Well, we have to come out with some community thoughts and feelings about I'm things. Sure we have to come out with um, answers. No, just not necessarily yeah. answers. We need to. We need to. Hear we we need community. to solicit opinion uh, at this meeting. And we need meeting. to educate the community. It's, mm -hmm. it's partially educational. It's partially mm -hmm. um, soliciting feedback. So you're um, looking for something that's almost like the one we did in September. I am looking, no, actually, so, I, so let me tell you a little bit of details. I, we'll, actually, for the next school committee meeting, we should have a draft agenda. We have mm -hmm. a draft agenda now, but we need to work on it more. Um, Stacy Smith of uh, Consensus Building Institute, who mm -hmm. is a hardy parent, who's worked with the town on numerous occasions, has volunteered her services. So she is going to meet with us on Monday, and we're going to talk details. Okay. Um, but basically, the idea is this, two parts, or three parts. First part, presentations, answering logistical questions. Second part, small group discussions at the table about broad visions. And the third part, specific areas talking about particular issues. So there might be a sort of area here about neighborhood schools, thoughts, feelings, concerns. Something else about grade distribution, eighth grade to the high school, you know, seven, you know whatever, um, thoughts, feelings, concerns. And so that we are both Broad and general and specific about about these. So ideas. I think I think it should be a school committee. Okay, so that's that's the question. So, but um, but I do want to give you guys all more details, and that will definitely be mm -hmm. ready for the next. School so committee. I think it should. Be so then, when we get the details, we can decide how we want to do it. But uh, yeah, it you sounds like a school a, committee event. I think it's okay, a school committee okay, event okay, with great. all seven yeah. of us up, up yeah. front. Yeah. We, we, yeah. So okay, so we should take a vote on that next time when we see the agenda. Okay, okay, that's okay. fine. The reason I actually brought it for you tonight is I thought when we start advertising it, I could advertise it as such. It's a school committee event, and uh, how we or structure and organize it uh, doesn't much matter. So we but can we advertise it now that it's a school, as a school committee, committee event. Okay, that's, 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 that's the question to, I wanted to get advise, to. Uh, any qu objections to advertising this event as a school committee event? Seeing none, go for it. Okay, great. Okay, that's okay. what I wanted. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see, executive session minutes, we've done that, warrant committee, people have been paid, school enrollment task force, we just talked about we've talked well. about that up, down, sideways. Uh, we need a vote to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Arlington School Committee and the Arlington Education Association, Unit A, health insurance premium deductions for employees who receive 21 paychecks per year. So moved. Moved by Mr. Second. Thielman, second by Mr. Pierce. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, all opposed? Uh, the chair will sign the document. We have now reached the point of executive session. Uh, I don't have the official legal language in front of me. But uh, we're going into executive session for the purposes of uh, I'm trying to do this from memory, and it's, it's, ten, it's after 10 o'clock. For purposes of negotiation. For purposes of negotiating and preparing for negotiations, which, if held in public, might be detrimental to the, uh, to the district. We will not return to uh, public session after the meeting. Uh, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Mr. Pierce. Uh, roll call, Dr. Allison Ampey. Mr. Thiel, Aye. Dr. Seuss, yes. uh, Ms. Starks, aye. Aye. Uh, Mr. Pierce, the chair votes aye. We are in executive session. Thank you for everybody for watching this wonderful little TV show tonight. <laughs>